part one of yellowstone national park six early pieces this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by david wales yellowstone national park six early pieces by various part one ferdinand vandeveer hayden and the founding of the yellowstone national park one of the prime movers among the many explorers of the west who played key roles in establishing the yellowstone national park was ferdinand vandeveer hayden of the u s geological and geographical survey of the territories a predecessor of today's u s geological survey his signal accomplishments in eighteen seventy one seventy two were among the many highlights of a long and distinguished career in public service hayden's professional training was as a doctor of medicine it is a tribute to his determination and energy that he reached this professional status born in westfield massachusetts on september seventh eighteen twenty nine he was in his early youth sent by his widowed mother to live with an uncle on a farm in rochester new york following an unusually studious childhood he began teaching school when he was sixteen years old he soon became discontented with what he considered an inadequate education and made his way to oberlin ohio there he persuaded the president of oberlin college to allow him to enroll in medical school although he was virtually penniless young hayden proved to be a diligent and dedicated student and won the respect of classmates and professors alike for his hard-working attitude none however foresaw the great success that he later achieved while working his way through college hayden formed a close association with a young geologist named john strong newberry who persuaded hayden to pursue his studies under his own former teacher james hall of albany new york soon after hayden enrolled at albany medical college and though he graduated with an m d in eighteen fifty three it is during this time that his interest in geology was fostered under the influence of professor hall shortly after his graduation from medical school hayden set out on his first geographical expedition under the sponsorship of hall accompanied by the paleontologist fielding bradford meek hayden headed up the missouri river to explore the dakota badlands and to collect fossil specimens returning in eighteen fifty four he and meek began to acquire reputations of their own and as a team they added significant geological information to what was known about the nation's western frontier during the war between the states hayden practiced medicine for the only time in his career serving with the army as a surgeon following the war he received his first formal degree in geology when he was elected professor of geology and mineralogy at the university of pennsylvania in eighteen sixty five a post he held mainly in absentia for seven years for the next several years much of his time was spent studying and reporting on the geology of the nebraska territory and rocky mountain region in eighteen sixty nine hayden's activities became officially organized under the department of the interior as the united states geological and geographical survey of the territories in that same year he completed a highly successful expedition through the western mountains from denver to santa fe this expedition set the pattern for those to follow for his team studied not only the geology but virtually all natural phenomena which they encountered including wildlife water resources and mineral deposits hayden's historic expedition into the yellowstone area in eighteen seventy one was preceded by two expeditions which fired the imagination of those interested in that largely unknown region the Folsom Cook Group penetrated the Yellowstone country in 1869, followed by the Washburn Langford Doan expedition in 1870. Lieutenant Gustavus C. Doan, who served as the leader of the military escort for this latter expedition, as well as for the later Hayden survey, filed a detailed report which was published as a congressional document and became a landmark of the Yellowstone story. The following is taken from his report. Quote, 
we kept the yellowstone to our left and finding the canyon impassable passed over several high spurs coming down from the mountains over which the way was much obstructed by fallen timber and reached at an elevation of seven thousand three hundred and thirty one feet an immense rolling plateau extending as far as the eye could reach this elevated slope of country is about thirty miles in extent with a general declivity to the northward its surface is an undulated prairie dotted with groves of pine and aspen numerous lakes are scattered throughout its whole extent and great numbers of springs which flow down the slopes and are lost in the volume of the yellowstone the river breaks through this plateau in a winding and impassable canyon and trachyte lava over two thousand feet in depth the middle canyon of the yellowstone rolling over volcanic boulders in some places and in others forming still pools of seemingly fathomless depth at one point it dashes here and there lashed to a white foam upon its rocky bed at another it subsides into a crystal mirror wherever a deep basin occurs in the channel numerous small cascades are seen tumbling from the lofty summits a mere ribbon of foam in the immeasurable distance below this huge abyss through walls of flinty lava has not been worn away by the waters for no trace of fluvial agency is left upon the rocks it is cleft in the strata brought about by volcanic action plainly shown by that irregular structure which gives such a ragged appearance to all such igneous formations standing on the brink of the chasm the heavy roaring of the imprisoned river comes to the ear in a sort of hollow hungry growl scarcely audible from the depths and strongly suggestive of demons in torment below lofty pines on the bank of the stream dwindle to shrubs in dizziness of distance everything beneath has a weird and deceptive appearance the water does not look like water but like oil numerous fish-hawks are seen busily plying their vocation sailing high above the waters and yet a thousand feet below the spectator in the clefts of the rocks hundreds of feet down bald eagles have their eyries from which we can see them swooping still further into the depths to rob the ospreys of their hard-earned trout it is grand gloomy and terrible a solitude peopled with fantastic ideas and empire of shadows and of turmoil End quote. spurred on by these reports hayden organized his expedition with the support of a forty thousand dollar appropriation from congress on june one eighteen seventy one a team of thirty four men and seven wagons set out from ogden utah among the group were geologist and managing director james stevenson mineralogist a c peel topographer antoine schoenborn artists henry w elliott and thomas moran and photographer william h jackson the latter two proved to be invaluable members of the expedition for their work served as dramatic and effective publicity in favor of establishing the park moran's famous landscapes were afterwards hung in the halls of congress and jackson's equally famous photographs portraying the primeval grandeur of the yellowstone were widely distributed after several weeks travel the hayden expedition reached Bertler's ranch in the yellowstone river valley there they were joined by the barlow heap military party of engineer explorers who also planned a reconnaissance of the upper yellowstone this latter group intermittently explored with the hayden expedition during the next several weeks the results of the barlow heap explorations were published as a modest senate document which proved to be of material help in establishing the yellowstone national park the joint hayden barlow heap expeditions departed from Bertler's on july twenty eighteen seventy one the journey through the wilderness was by no means an easy one the wagons had to be abandoned and the gear packed on mules progress was slow and the difficulty of moving through the dense forest was compounded by the great number of trees felled by fires that periodically swept the region the yellowstone basin however proved to be an ideal open-air laboratory for the geologist and perhaps one of the best places on earth for studying active volcanic processes because of the wide variety of geological features 
each of the scientists accompanying the expedition found unique opportunities for observation and study hayden recorded his thoughts as his party advanced up the river Quote, but the objects of the deepest interest in this region are the falls and the grand canyon of the yellowstone i will attempt to convey some idea by a description but it is only through the eye that the mind can gather anything like an adequate conception of them but no language can do justice to the wonderful grandeur and beauty of the canyon below the lower falls the very nearly vertical walls slightly sloping down to the water's edge on either side so that from the summit of the river appears like a thread of silver foaming over its rocky bottom the variegated colors of the sides yellow red brown white all intermixed and shading into each other the gothic columns of every form standing out from the sides of the walls with greater variety and more striking colors than ever adorned a work of human art End quote. hayden continued to describe the falls quote, standing near the margin of the lower falls and looking down the canyon with its sides twelve hundred to fifteen hundred feet high and decorated with the most brilliant colors that the human eye ever saw with the rocks weathered into an almost unlimited variety of forms the whole presents a picture that would be difficult to surpass in nature from any point of view the upper falls are most picturesque and striking the entire volume of water seems to be as it were hurled off the precipice with the force which it has accumulated in the rapids above so that the mass is detached into the most beautiful snow-white bead-like drops and as it strikes the rocky basin below it shoots through the water with a sort of ricochet for the distance of two hundred feet End quote. of the yellowstone itself hayden said quote, the river by its width its beautiful curves and easy flow moves on down towards its wonderful precipices with a majestic motion that would charm the eye of an artist End quote. however not all was majestic beauty for there was also the power and mystery of the geysers and the grotesque forms of the hot mud springs hayden described these phenomena such as one geyser he named the grotto Quote, a vast column of steam issues from a cavern in the side of the hill with an opening about five feet in diameter the roaring of the waters in the cavern and the noise of the waters as they surge up to the mouth of the opening are like that of the billows lashing the seashore the water is as clear as crystal and the steam is so hot that it is only when the breeze wafts it aside for a moment one can venture to take a look at the opening located higher up on the side of the hill not far from the grotto is the most remarkable mud spring we have ever seen in the west it may not improbably be called the giant's cauldron it does not boil with an impulse like most of the mud springs but with a constant roar which shakes the ground for a considerable distance and may be heard for half a mile all the indications around this most remarkable cauldron show it has broken out at a recent period End quote examining the mud springs and geysers was hazardous business and could be a painful experience as hayden discovered quote, the entire surface is perfectly bare of vegetation and hot yielding in many places to slight pressure i attempted to walk among these simmering vents and broke through to my knees covering myself with hot mud to my great pain and subsequent inconvenience End quote finally the expedition reached yellowstone lake the focal point of their exploration causing hayden to remark quote, on the twenty eighth of july we arrived at the lake and pitched our camp on the northeast shore in a beautiful grassy meadow or opening among the dense pines the lake lay before us a vast sheet of quiet water of a most delicate ultramarine hue one of the most beautiful scenes i have ever beheld the entire party was filled with enthusiasm the great object of our labors has been reached and we were amply paid for all our toils such a vision is worth a lifetime and only one of such marvelous beauty will ever greet human eye from whatever point of view one may behold it it presents a unique picture End quote. hayden's party split into groups with some continuing to explore the perimeter of the lake 
while hayden shernburn and other members of the expedition went on towards the firehole geyser basin eventually the entire party arrived back at Burtler's ranch having spent thirty-eight days in the wilderness the most important product of the expedition in addition to jackson's photos was a five hundred page report by hayden documenting findings of his party hayden presented this report and photos to senators congressmen his superiors in the interior department and nearly anyone else who could possibly influence the founding of a park he also wrote articles in magazines with national circulation and spent much personal time and effort in trying to convince congress to establish the park on december eighteenth eighteen seventy one a bill was introduced simultaneously in the senate by senator pomeroy of kansas and in the house of representatives by congressman claggett of montana for the establishment of a park at the headwaters of the yellowstone river the bill in each case was referred to the respective committees on public lands upon reporting the bill back to the senate on january twenty two eighteen seventy two senator pomeroy advised that body quote, professor hayden and party have been there and this bill is drawn on the recommendation of that gentleman to consecrate for public uses this country for a public park End quote. Quote, be it enacted and so forth that the tract of land in the territories of montana and wyoming lying near the headwaters of the yellowstone river and described as follows to wit commencing at the junction of gardner's river with the yellowstone river and running east to the meridian passing ten miles to the eastward of the most eastward point of the yellowstone lake thence south along said meridian to the parallel of latitude passing ten miles south of the most southern point of yellowstone lake thence west along said parallel to the meridian passing fifteen miles west of the most western point of madison lake thence north along said meridian of the latitude of the junction of the yellowstone and gardner's river thence east of the place of beginning is hereby reserved and withdrawn from settlement occupancy or sale under the laws of the united states and dedicated and set apart as a public park or pleasuring ground for the benefit and enjoyment of the people and all persons who shall locate or settle upon or occupy the same or any part thereof except as hereinafter provided shall be considered trespassers and removed therefrom section two that said public park shall be under the exclusive control of the secretary of the interior whose duty it shall be as soon as practicable to make and publish such rules and regulations as he may deem necessary or proper for the care and management of the same such regulations shall provide for the preservation from injury or spoliation of all timber mineral deposits natural curiosities or wonders within said park and their retention in their natural condition the secretary may in his discretion grant leases for building purposes for terms not exceeding ten years of small parcels of ground at such places in said park as shall require the erection of buildings for the accommodation of visitors all of the proceeds of said leases and all other revenues that may be derived from any source connected with said park to be expended under his direction in the management of the same and the construction of roads and bridle paths therein he shall provide against the wanton destruction of the fish and game found within said park and against their capture or destruction for the purpose of merchandise or profit he shall also cause all persons trespassing upon the same after the passage of this act to be removed therefrom and generally shall be authorized to take all such measures as shall be necessary or proper to fully carry out the object and purposes of this act End quote. on january twenty three eighteen seventy two senator pomeroy in response to questioning during consideration of the bill stated quote, this bill originated as the result of the exploration made by professor hayden under an appropriation of congress last year with a party he explored the headwaters of the yellowstone and found it to be a great natural curiosity 
great geysers as they are termed water spouts and hot springs and having plotted the ground himself and having given me the dimensions of it the bill was drawn up as it was thought best to consecrate and set apart this great place or national resort as it may be in the future for the purpose of public enjoyment the senate sitting as committee of the whole gave its final consideration to the bill on january thirty there was limited floor discussion basically concerning whether or not the land was suitable for agricultural development the bill's chief supporters convinced their colleagues that the region's real value was as a park area to be preserved in its natural state and the bill passed by a comfortable margin the house considered the same bill on february twenty seven again the question was raised as to whether the region should be left open for agricultural development however as in the senate the obvious value of the region as a scenic preserve made the task of the park's advocates an easy one the bill was readily passed with a hundred and fifteen yeas to sixty-five nays and sixty not voting on march one eighteen seventy two president grant signed the bill into law establishing the yellowstone region as a public park thus setting a major conservation precedent the nation had its first national park an area of unique beauty was set aside for the enjoyment of generations to come and a tradition of preserving other such areas was established end of part one part two of yellowstone national park six early pieces by various this librivox recording is in the public domain part two the wonders of the yellowstone part one i had indulged for several years a great curiosity to see the wonders of the upper valley of the yellowstone the stories told by trappers and mountaineers of the natural phenomena of that region were so strange and marvellous that as long ago as eighteen sixty six i first contemplated the possibility of organizing an expedition for the express purpose of exploring it during the past year meeting with several gentlemen who expressed like curiosity we determined to make the journey in the months of august and september the yellowstone and columbia the first flowing into the missouri and the last into the pacific divided from each other by the rocky mountains have their sources within a few miles of each other both rise in the mountains which separate idaho from the new territory of wyoming but the headwaters of the yellowstone are only accessible from montana the mountains surrounding the basin from which they flow are very lofty covered with pines and on the southeastern side present to the traveller a precipitous wall of rock several thousand feet in height this barrier prevented captain reynolds from visiting the headwaters of the yellowstone while prosecuting an expedition planned by the government and placed under his command for the purpose of exploring that river in eighteen fifty nine the source of the yellowstone is in a magnificent lake nearly nine thousand feet above the level of the ocean in its course of one thousand three hundred miles to the missouri it falls about seven thousand two hundred feet its upper waters flow through deep canyons and gorges and are broken by immense cataracts and fearful rapids presenting at various points some of the grandest scenery on the continent this country is entirely volcanic and abounds in boiling springs mud volcanoes huge mountains of sulphur and geysers more extensive and numerous than those of iceland old mountaineers and trappers are great romancers i have met with many but never one who was not fond of practising upon the credulity of those who listened to his adventures bridger than whom perhaps no man has experienced more of wild mountain life has been so much in the habit of embellishing his indian adventures that they are received by all who know him with many grains of allowance this want of faith will account for the scepticism with which the oft-repeated stories of the wonders of the upper yellowstone were received by people who had lived within one hundred and twenty miles of them and who at any time could have established their verity by ten days travel our company composed of some of the officials and leading citizens of montana felt that if 
the half was true they would be amply compensated for all the troubles and hazards of the expedition it was nevertheless a serious undertaking and as the time drew near for our departure several who had been foremost to join us upon the receipt of intelligence that a large party of indians had come into the upper yellowstone valley found excuse for their withdrawal in various emergent occupations so that when the day for our departure arrived our company was reduced in numbers to nine and consisted of the following named gentlemen general h d washburn who served with distinction during the war of the rebellion and subsequently represented the clinton district of indiana in the congress of the united states samuel t hauser president of the first national bank of helena cornelius hedges a leading member of the bar of montana the hon truman c everts late united states assessor for montana walter trumbull son of senator trumbull ben stickney jr warren c gillette jacob smith and the writer the preparation was simple each man was supplied with a strong horse well equipped with california saddle bridle and cantinas a needle gun a belt filled with cartridges a pair of revolvers a hunting knife added to the usual costume of the mountains completed the personal outfit of each member of the expedition when mounted and ready to start we resembled more a band of brigands than sober men in search of natural wonders our provisions consisting of bacon dried fruit flour and so forth were securely lashed to the backs of twelve broncos which were placed in charge of a couple of packers we also employed two colored boys as cooks major general hancock in favorable response to our application for a military escort had given orders for a company of cavalry to accompany us which we expected to join at fort ellis in the gallatin valley a distance of one hundred and twenty miles from helena we were none the less obliged to general hancock for his prompt compliance with our application for an escort because of his own desire previously expressed to learn something of the country we explored which would be of service to him in the disposition of the troops under his command for frontier defence and if the result of our explorations in the least contributed to that end we still remain the debtor of that officer for his courtesy and kindness without which we might have failed altogether in our undertaking our ride to fort ellis through a well-settled portion of the territory was accomplished in four days that portion of the valleys of the missouri and gallatin through which we passed dotted with numerous ranches presented large fields of wheat oats potatoes and other evidences of thrift common in agricultural districts large droves of cattle were feeding upon the bunch grass which carpeted the valleys and foothills even the mountains so wild solemn and unsocial a few years ago seemed to be domesticated as they reared their familiar summits in long and continuous succession along the bordering uplands at the three forks where the jefferson madison and gallatin unite and form the missouri a thriving agricultural community has sprung up which must eventually grow into a town of considerable importance entering the magnificent valley of the gallatin at this point our course up the river lay through one of the finest agricultural regions on the continent the soil is remarkably fertile and the valley stretches away on either side a distance of twenty miles to immense mountain ranges which traverse its entire length enclosing a territory as large as one of the larger new england states every foot of which is susceptible of the highest cultivation bozeman a picturesque village of seven hundred inhabitants situated at the foot of the belt range of mountains is considered one of the most important prospective business locations in montana it is near the mouth of one of the few mountain passes of the territory deemed practicable for railroad improvement its inhabitants are patiently awaiting the time when the cars of the northern pacific will descend into their streets the village is neatly built of wood and brick its surroundings are magnificent the eye can distinctly trace the mountains by which it is encircled a distance of four hundred miles fort ellis three miles distant is built upon a table of land elevated above the valley and which overlooks it for a great distance our party was welcomed by colonel raker the commandant and we pitched our tent near the post 
on the morning succeeding our arrival we were informed that owing to the absence on duty of most of the soldiers a fraction of a company five cavalrymen and a lieutenant in command were all that could be afforded for our escort but realizing that a small body of white men can more easily elude a band of indians than can a large party and without hesitating to consider the possible defence which we could make against a war party of hostile sioux with this limited number we declared ourselves satisfied and took our departure for the terra incognita as fully assured of a successful journey as if our number had been multiplied by hundreds our pack-horses were brought up and their loads fastened to them with that incredible rapidity and skill which is the result only of lifelong practice the dexterity with which a skilful packer will load and unload his horse is remarkable the rope is thrown around the body of the animal and securely fastened in less time than it takes to tell it no matter what the character of the beast wild or tame it is under the perfect control of its master the bronco is however a refractory customer he has many tricks unknown to his well-trained brother of the east bucking is a frequent vice for which there is small remedy but as was proved in a single instance on the morning we left the fort that horse must be more expert than was any of our train who can foil an experienced packer every leap of the enraged brute only increased the tension of the cord which bound and finally subdued him and rendered him tractable once under way our little company now increased to nineteen presented quite a formidable appearance as by dint of whip and spur our steeds gaily wheeled across the plain towards the mountains after a tedious ride of several hours up steep acclivities over rocks and through dark defiles we at length passed over the summit of the mountain range took a last look of the beautiful valley of the gallatin and descended into a ravine coursed by the waters of trail creek following this two days we came to the yellowstone up which we rode to the solitary ranch of the brothers Boteler the last abode of civilized man in the direction of our travels these hardy mountaineers received and entertained us in hardy mountain style giving us the best of everything their ranch afforded together with a great deal of information and advice about the country which we afterwards found to be invaluable the bodlers belong to that class of pioneers of which there are many in the new territories who are only satisfied when their location and field of operations are a little in advance of civilization exposed to privation and danger and yet unite with these discomforts some advantages of hunting trapping and fishing not enjoyed by men contented to dwell in safety free-hearted jolly and brave living upon such means as the country afforded accustomed to roam for days and weeks in the mountains in pursuit of game and furs their experience renewed our courage and the descriptions which they gave us of the wonders they had seen increased our curiosity it was not pleasant however to learn that twenty-five lodges of crows had gone up the valley a few days before our arrival or to be told by a trapper whom we met that he had been robbed by them and in common parlance been set on foot by having his horse and provisions stolen in anticipation of possible trouble from this source we organized our company and elected general h d washburn surveyor general of montana commander it was understood that we should make but one march each day starting at eight a m and camping at three p m this obviated the necessity of unpacking and cooking a dinner at night the horses were to be carefully picketed a fire built beyond them and two of the company to keep guard until one o'clock then to be relieved by two others who were to watch until daylight this divided the labor among fourteen who were to serve as picket men twice each week these precautionary measures being fully understood we left bodelers plunging at once into the vast unknown which lay before us following the slight indian trail we travelled near the bank of the river amid the wildest imaginable scenery of river rock and mountain the foothills were covered with verdure which an autumnal sun had sprinkled with maroon-coloured tints very delicate and beautiful the path was narrow rocky and uneven 
frequently leading over high hills in ascent and descent more or less abrupt and difficult the increasing altitude of the route was more perceptible than any over which we had ever travelled and the river whenever visible was a perfect mountain torrent while descending a hill into one of the broad openings of the valley our attention was suddenly arrested by half a dozen or more mounted indians who were riding down the foothills on the opposite side of the river two of our company who had lingered behind came up with the information that they had seen several more making observations from behind a small butte from which they fled in great haste on being discovered they soon rode down on the plateau to a point where their horses were hobbled and for a long time watched our party as it continued its course of travel up the river our camp was guarded that night with more than ordinary vigilance a hard rainstorm which set in early in the afternoon and continued through the night may have saved us from an attack by these prowlers when we started the next morning general washburn detailed four of our company to guard the pack train while he with four others rode in advance to make the most practicable selection of routes six miles above our camp we ascended the spur of a mountain which came down boldly to the river's edge from its summit we had a beautiful view of the valley stretched out before us the river fringed with cottonwood trees the foothills covered with luxuriant many-tinted herbage and over all the snow-crowned summits of the mountains many miles away but seemingly rising from the midst of the plateau at our feet looking up the river the valley opened widely and from the rock on which we stood was visible the train of pack-horses slowly winding their way along the sinuous trail which followed the inequalities of the mountain-side the whole formed a scene of great interest pursuing our course a few miles further we camped just below the lower canyon of the river our hunters provided us with a sumptuous meal of antelope rabbit duck grouse and trout the night was very cold the mercury standing at forty degrees when we broke camp at eight o'clock the next morning we remained some time at the lower canyon of the yellowstone which as a single isolated piece of scenery is very beautiful it is less than a mile in length and perhaps does not exceed a thousand feet in depth its walls are vertical and seen from the summit of the precipice the river seems forced through a narrow gorge and is surging and boiling at a fearful rate the water breaking into millions of prismatic drops against every projecting rock after travelling six miles over the mountains above the canyon we again descended into a broad and open valley skirted by a level upland for several miles here an object met our attention which deserves more than a casual notice it was two parallel vertical walls of rock projecting from the side of a mountain to the height of a hundred and twenty five feet traversing the mountain from base to summit a distance of one thousand five hundred feet these walls were not to exceed thirty feet in width and their tops for the whole length were crowned with a growth of pines the sides were as even as if they had been worked by line and plumb the whole space between and on either side of them having been completely eroded and washed away we had seen many of the capricious works wrought by erosion upon the friable rocks of montana but never before upon so majestic a scale here an entire mountainside by wind and water had been removed leaving as the evidence of their protracted toil these vertical projections which but for their immensity might as readily be mistaken for works of art as of nature their smooth sides uniform width and height and great length considered in connection with the causes which had wrought their insulation excited our wonder and admiration they were all the more curious because of their dissimilarity to any other striking objects in natural scenery that we had ever seen or heard of in future years when the wonders of the yellowstone are incorporated into the family of fashionable resorts there will be few of its attractions surpassing in interest this marvellous freak of the elements for some reason best understood by himself one of our companions gave to these rocks the name of the devil's slide 
the suggestion was unfortunate as with more reason perhaps but with no better taste we frequently had occasion to appropriate other portions of the person of his satanic majesty or of his dominion in signification of the varied marvels we met with some little excuse may be found for this in the fact that the old mountaineers and trappers who preceded us had been peculiarly lavish in the use of the infernal vocabulary every river and glen and mountain had suggested to their imaginations some fancied resemblance to portions of a region which their pious grandmothers had warned them to avoid it is common for them when speaking of this region to designate portions of its physical features as firehole prairie the devil's glen hell roaring river and so forth and these names from a remarkable fitness of things are not likely to be speedily superseded by others less impressive we camped at the close of this day's travel near the southwestern corner of montana at the mouth of gardner's river crossing this stream the next morning we passed over several rocky ridges into a valley which for a long distance was crowded with the spires of protruding rocks which gave it such a dismal aspect that we named it the valley of desolation the trail was so rough and mountainous that we were able to travel but six miles before the usual hour for camping much of the distance was through fallen timber almost impassable by the pack train a mile before camping we discovered on the trail the fresh tracks of unshod ponies indicating that a party of indians had recently passed over it lieutenant doane with one of our company had left us in the morning and did not come into camp this evening one of our horses broke his lariat during the night and galloped through the camp rousing the sleepers who grasped their guns supposing the indians were really upon them we started early the next morning and soon struck the trail which had been travelled the preceding day by lieutenant doane it led over a more practicable route than the one we left the marks made in the soil by the travois lodge holes on the side of the trail showed that it had been recently travelled by a number of lodges of indians and a little colt which we overtook soon after making the discovery convinced us that we were in their immediate vicinity our party was separated and if we had been attacked our pack train horses and stores would have been an easy conquest fortunately we were unmolested and when again united made a fresh resolution to travel as much in company as possible all precautionary measures however unless enforced by the sternest discipline are soon forgotten and danger until actually impending is seldom borne in mind a day had scarcely passed when we were as reckless as ever from the summit of a commanding range which separated the waters of antelope and tower creeks we descended through a picturesque gorge leading our horses to a small stream flowing into the yellowstone four miles of travel a great part of it down the precipitous slopes of the mountain brought us to the banks of tower creek and within the volcanic region where the wonders were supposed to commence on the right of the trail our attention was first attracted by a small hot sulphur spring a little below the boiling point in temperature leaving the spring we ascended a high ridge from which the most noticeable feature in a landscape of great extent and beauty was column rock stretching for two miles along the eastern bank of the yellowstone at the distance from which we saw it we could compare it in appearance to nothing but a section of the giant's causeway it was composed of successive pillars of basalt overlying and underlying a thick stratum of cement and gravel resembling pudding stone in both rows the pillars standing in close proximity were each about thirty feet high and from three to five feet in diameter this interesting object more from the novelty of its formation and its beautiful surroundings of mountain and river scenery than anything grand or impressive in its appearance excited our attention until the gathering shades of evening reminded us of the necessity of selecting a suitable camp we descended the declivity to the banks of tower creek and camped on a rocky terrace one mile distant from and four hundred feet above the yellowstone tower creek is a mountain torrent flowing through a gorge about forty yards wide 
just below our camp it falls perpendicularly over an even ledge a hundred and twelve feet forming one of the most beautiful cataracts in the world for some distance above the falls the stream is broken into a great number of channels each of which has worked a tortuous course through a compact body of shale to the verge of the precipice where they reunite and form the fall the countless shapes into which the shale has been wrought by the action of the angry waters add a feature of great interest to the scene spires of solid shale capped with slate beautifully rounded and polished faultless in symmetry raise their tapering forms to the height of from eighty to a hundred and fifty feet all over the plateau above the cataract some resemble towers others the spires of churches and others still shoot up as lithe and slender as the minarets of a mosque some of the loftiest of these formations standing like sentinels upon the very brink of the fall are accessible to an expert and adventurous climber the position attained on one of their narrow summits amid the roar of waters and at a height of two hundred and fifty feet above the boiling chasm as the writer can affirm requires a steady head and strong nerves yet the view which rewards the temerity of the exploit is full of compensations below the fall the stream descends in numerous rapids with frightful velocity through a gloomy gorge to its union with the yellowstone its bed is filled with enormous boulders against which the rushing waters break with great fury many of the capricious formations wrought from the shale excite merriment as well as wonder of this kind especially was a huge mass sixty feet in height which from its supposed resemblance to the proverbial foot of his satanic majesty we called the devil's hoof the scenery of mountain rock and forest surrounding the falls is very beautiful here too the hunter and fisherman can indulge their tastes with the certainty of ample reward as a half-way resort to the greater wonders still farther up the marvellous river the visitor of future years will find no more delightful resting-place no account of this beautiful fall has ever been given by any of the former visitors to this region the name of tower falls which we gave it was suggested by some of the most conspicuous features of the scenery early the next morning several of our company left in advance to explore a passage for our pack train over the mountains which were very steep and lofty we had been following a bend in the river but as no sign of a change in its course was apparent our object was by finding a shorter route across the country to avoid several days of toilsome travel the advance party ascended a lofty peak by barometrical measurement ten thousand five hundred and eighty feet above ocean level which in honor of our commander was called mount washburn from its summit four hundred feet above the line of perpetual snow we were able to trace the course of the river to its source in yellowstone lake at the point where we crossed the line of vegetation the snow covered the side of the apex of the mountain to the depth of twenty feet and seemed to be as solid as the rocks upon which it rested descending the mountain we came upon the trail made by the pack train at its base which we followed into camp at the head of a small stream flowing into the yellowstone following this stream in the direction of its mouth at the distance of a mile below our camp we crossed an immense bed of volcanic ashes thirty feet deep extending one hundred yards along both sides of the creek less than a mile beyond we suddenly came upon a hideous-looking glen filled with a sulphurous vapour emitted from six or eight boiling springs of great size and activity one of our company aptly compared it to the entrance to the infernal regions it looked like nothing earthly we had ever seen and the pungent fumes which filled the atmosphere were not unaccompanied by a disagreeable sense of possible suffocation entering the basin cautiously we found the entire surface of the earth covered with the encrusted centre thrown from the springs jets of hot vapour were expelled through a hundred natural orifices with which it was pierced and through every fracture made by passing over it 
the springs themselves were as diabolical in appearance as the witch's cauldron in macbeth and needed but the presence of hecate and her weird band to realize that horrible creation of poetic fancy they were all in a state of violent ebullition throwing their liquid contents to the height of three or four feet the largest had a basin twenty by forty feet in diameter its greenish-yellow water was covered with bubbles which were constantly rising bursting and emitting sulphurous gas from various parts of its surface the central spring seethed and bubbled like a boiling cauldron fearful volumes of vapour were constantly escaping it near it was another not so large but more infernal in appearance its contents of the consistency of paint were in constant noisy ebullition a stick thrust into it on being withdrawn was coated with lead-coloured slime a quarter of an inch in thickness nothing flows from this spring seemingly it is boiling down a fourth spring which exhibited the same physical features was partly covered by an overhanging ledge of rock we tried to fathom it but the bottom was beyond the reach of the longest pole we could find rocks cast into it increased the agitation of its waters there were several other springs in the group smaller in size but presenting the same characteristics the approach to them was unsafe the incrustation surrounding them bending in many places beneath our weight and from the fractures thus created would ooze a sulphury slime of the consistency of mucilage it was with great difficulty that we obtained specimens from the natural apertures with which the crust is filled a feat which was accomplished by one only of our party who extended himself at full length upon that portion of the incrustation which yielded the least but which was not sufficiently strong to bear his weight while in an upright position and at imminent risk of sinking into the infernal mixture rolled over and over to the edge of the opening and with the crust slowly bending and sinking beneath him hurriedly secured the coveted prize there was something so revolting in the general appearance of the springs and their surroundings the foulness of the vapours the infernal contents the treacherous incrustation the noisy ebullition the general appearance of desolation and the seclusion and wildness of the location that though awestruck we were not unreluctant to continue our journey without making them a second visit they were probably never before seen by white men the name of hell broth springs which we gave them fully expressed our appreciation of their character our journey the next day still continued through a country until then untravelled owing to the high lateral mountain spurs the numerous ravines and the interminable patches of fallen timber we made very slow progress but when the hour for camping arrived we were greatly surprised to find ourselves descending the mountain along the banks of a beautiful stream in the immediate vicinity of the great falls of the yellowstone this stream which we called cascade creek is very rapid just before its union with the river it passes through a gloomy gorge of abrupt descent which on either side is filled with continuous masses of obsidian that have been worn by the water into many fantastic shapes and cavernous recesses this we named the devil's den near the foot of the gorge the creek breaks from fearful rapids into a cascade of great beauty the first fall of five feet is immediately succeeded by another of fifteen into a pool as clear as amber nestled beneath overarching rocks here it lingers as if half reluctant to continue its course and then gracefully emerges from the grotto and veiling the rocks down an abrupt descent of eighty-four feet passes rapidly on to the yellowstone it received the name of crystal the great falls are at the head of one of the most remarkable canyons in the world a gorge through volcanic rocks fifty miles long and varying from one thousand to nearly five thousand feet in depth in its descent through this wonderful chasm the river falls almost three thousand feet 
at one point where the passage has been worn through a mountain range our hunters assured us it was more than a vertical mile in depth and the river broken into rapids and cascades appeared no wider than a ribbon the brain reels as we gaze into this profound and solemn solitude we shrink from the dizzy verge appalled glad to feel the solid earth under our feet and venture no more except with forms extended and faces barely protruding over the edge of the precipice the stillness is horrible down 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 we see the river attenuated to a thread tossing its miniature waves and dashing with puny strength the massive walls which imprison it all access to its margin is denied and the dark gray rocks hold it in dismal shadow even the voice of its waters in their convulsive agony cannot be heard uncheered by plant or shrub obstructed with massive boulders and by jutting points it rushes madly on its solitary course deeper and deeper into the bowels of the rocky firmament the solemn grandeur of the scene surpasses description it must be seen to be felt the sense of danger with which it impresses you is harrowing in the extreme you feel the absence of sound the oppression of absolute silence if you could only hear that gurgling river if you could only see a living tree in the depth beneath you if a bird would fly past if the wind would move any object in the awful chasm to break for a moment the solemn silence that reigns there it would relieve that tension of the nerves which the scene has excited and you would rise from your prostrate condition and thank god that he had permitted you to gaze unharmed upon this majestic display of natural architecture as it is sympathizing in spirit with the deep gloom of the scene you crawl from the dreadful verge scared lest the firm rock give way beneath and precipitate you into the horrid gulf we had been told by trappers and mountaineers that there were cataracts in this vicinity a thousand feet high but if so they must be lower down the canyon in that portion of it which by our journey across the bend in the river we failed to see we regretted when too late that we had not made a fuller exploration for by no other theory than that there was a stupendous fall below us or that the river was broken by a continued succession of cascades could we account for a difference of nearly three thousand feet in altitude between the head and the mouth of the canyon in that part of the canyon which we saw the inclination of the river was marked by frequent falls fifteen and twenty feet in height sufficient if continuous through it to accomplish the entire descent the fearful descent into this terrific canyon was accomplished with great difficulty by messrs hauser and stickney at a point about two miles below the falls by trigonometrical measurement they found the chasm at that point to be one thousand one hundred and ninety feet deep their ascent from it was perilous and it was only by making good use of hands and feet and keeping the nerves braced to the utmost tension that they were enabled to clamber up the precipitous rocks to a safe landing-place the effort was successfully made but none others of the company were disposed to venture from a first view of the canyon we followed the river to the falls a grander scene than the lower cataract of the yellowstone was never witnessed by mortal eyes the volume seemed to be adapted to all the harmonies of the surrounding scenery had it been greater or smaller it would have been less impressive the river from a width of two hundred feet above the fall is compressed by converging rocks to one hundred and fifty feet where it takes the plunge the shelf over which it falls is as level and even as a work of art the height by actual line measurement is a few inches more than three hundred and fifty feet it is a sheer compact solid perpendicular sheet faultless in all the elements of grandeur and picturesque beauties the canyon which commences at the upper fall half a mile above this cataract is here a thousand feet in depth its vertical sides rise gray and dark above the fall to shelving summits from which one can look down into the boiling spray-filled chasm enlivened with rainbows and glittering like a shower of diamonds 
from a shelf protruding over the stream five hundred feet below the top of the canyon and a hundred and eighty above the verge of the cataract a member of our company lying prone upon the rock let down a cord with a stone attached into the gulf and measured its profoundest depths the life and sound of the cataract with its sparkling spray and fleecy foam contrast strangely with the sombre stillness of the canyon a mile below there all was darkness gloom and shadow here all was vivacity gaiety and delight one was the most unsocial the other the most social scene in nature we could talk and sing and whoop waking the echoes with our mirth and laughter in presence of the falls but we could not thus profane the silence of the canyon seen through the canyon below the falls the river for a mile or more is broken by rapids and cascades of great variety and beauty between the lower and upper falls the canyon is two hundred to nearly four hundred feet deep the river runs over a level bed of rock and is undisturbed by rapids until near the verge of the lower fall the upper fall is entirely unlike the other but in its peculiar character equally interesting for some distance above it the river breaks into frightful rapids the stream is narrowed between the rocks as it approaches the brink and bounds with impatient struggles for release leaping through the stony jaws in a sheet of snow-white foam over a precipice nearly perpendicular a hundred and fifteen feet high midway in its descent the entire volume of water is carried by the sloping surface of an intervening ledge twelve or fifteen feet beyond the vertical base of the precipice gaining therefrom a novel and interesting feature the churning of the water upon the rocks reduces it to a mass of foam and spray through which all the colors of the solar spectrum are reproduced in astonishing profusion what this cataract lacks in sublimity is more than compensated by picturesqueness the rocks which overshadow it do not veil it from the open light it is up amid the pine foliage which crowns the adjacent hills the grand feature of a landscape unrivalled for beauties of vegetation as well as of rock and glen the two confronting rocks overhanging the verge at the height of a hundred feet or more could be readily united by a bridge from which some of the grandest views of natural scenery in the world could be obtained while just in front of and within reaching distance of the arrowy water from a table one-third of the way below the brink of the fall all its nearest beauties and terrors may be caught at a glance we rambled around the falls and canyon two days and left them with the unpleasant conviction that the greatest wonder of our journey had been seen we indulged in a last and lingering glance at the falls on the morning of the first day of autumn the sun shone brightly and the laughing waters of the upper fall were filled with the glitter of rainbows and diamonds nature in the excess of her prodigality had seemingly determined that this last look should be the brightest for there was everything in the landscape illuminated by the rising sun to invite a longer stay even the dismal canyon so dark and gray and still reflected here and there on its vertical surface patches of sunshine as much as to say see what i can do when i try long vistas of light broke through the pines which crowned the contiguous mountains and the snow-crowned peaks in the distance glistened like crystal catching the spirit of the scene we laughed and sung and whooped as we rambled hurriedly from point to point lingering only when the final moment came to receive the very last impression at length we turned our backs upon the scene and wended our way slowly up the river bank along a beaten trail the last vestige of the rapids disappeared at the distance of half a mile above the upper fall the river expanded to the width of four hundred feet rolled peacefully between low verdant banks the water for some distance was of that emerald hue which is so distinguishing a feature of niagara the bottom was pebbly and but for the treacherous quicksands and crevices of which it was full we could easily have forded the stream at any point between the falls and our camping-place we crossed a little creek strongly impregnated with alum 
and three miles beyond found ourselves in the midst of volcanic wonders of great variety and profusion the region was filled with boiling springs and craters two hills each three hundred feet high and from a quarter to half a mile across had been formed wholly of the center thrown from adjacent springs lava sulphur and reddish-brown clay hot streams of vapor were pouring from crevices scattered over them their surfaces answered in hollow intonations to every footstep and in several places yielded to the weight of our horses steaming vapor rushed hissingly from the fractures and all around the natural vents large quantities of sulphur and crystallized form perfectly pure had been deposited this could be readily gathered with pick and shovel a great many exhausted craters dotted the hillside one near the summit still alive changed its hues like steel under the process of tempering to every kiss of the passing breeze the hottest vapors were active beneath the encrusted surface everywhere a thick leathern glove was no protection to the hand exposed to them around these immense thermal deposits the country for a great distance in all directions is filled with boiling springs all exhibiting separate characteristics the most conspicuous of the cluster is a sulphur spring twelve by twenty feet in diameter encircled by a beautifully scalloped sedimentary border in which the water is thrown to a height of from three to seven feet the regular formation of the border and the perfect shading of the scallops forming it are among the most delicate and wonderful freaks of nature's handiwork they look like an elaborate work of art this spring is located at the western base of crater hill above described and the gentle slope around it for a distance of three hundred feet is covered to considerable depth with a mixture of sulphur and brown lava the moistened bed of a small channel leading from the spring down the slope indicated that it had recently overflowed a few rods north of the spring at the base of the hill is a cavern whose mouth is about seven feet in diameter from which a dense jet of sulphurous vapor explodes with a regular report like a high-pressure engine a little farther along we came upon another boiling spring seventy feet long by forty wide the water of which is dark and muddy and in unceasing agitation about a hundred yards distant we discovered a boiling alum spring surrounded with beautiful crystals from the border of which we gathered a quantity of alum nearly pure but slightly impregnated with iron the violent ebullition of the water had undermined the surrounding surface in many places and for the distance of several feet from the margin had so thoroughly saturated the incrustation with its liquid contents that it was unsafe to approach the edge as one of our company was unconcernedly passing near the brink the incrustation suddenly sloughed off beneath his feet a shout of alarm from his comrades aroused him to a sense of his peril and he only avoided being plunged into the boiling mixture by falling suddenly backward at full length upon the firm portion of the crust and rolling over to a place of safety his escape from a horrible death was most marvellous and in another instant he would have been beyond all human aid our efforts to sound the depths of this spring with a pole thirty-five feet in length were fruitless beyond this we entered a basin covered with the ancient deposit of some extinct crater which contained about thirty springs of boiling clay these unsightly cauldrons varied in size from two to ten feet in diameter their surfaces being from three to eight feet below the level of the plain the contents of most of them were of the consistency of thick paint which they greatly resembled some being yellow others pink and others dark brown this semi-fluid was boiling at a fearful rate much after the fashion of a hasty pudding in the last stages of completion the bubbles often two feet in height would explode with a puff emitting at each time a villainous smell of sulphurated vapour springs six and eight feet in diameter but four feet asunder presented distinct phenomenal characteristics there was no connection between them above or below the sediment varied in color and not unfrequently there would be an inequality of five feet in their surfaces each seemingly was supplied with a separate force 
they were embraced within a radius of twelve hundred feet which was covered with a strong incrustation the various vents in which emitted streams of heated vapour our silver watches and other metallic articles assumed a dark leaden hue the atmosphere was filled with sulphurous gases and the river opposite our camp was impregnated with the mineral bases of adjacent springs the valley through which we had made our day's journey was level and beautiful spreading away to grassy foothills which terminated in a horizon of mountains we spent the next day in examining the wonders surrounding us at the base of adjacent foothills we found three springs of boiling mud the largest of which forty feet in diameter encircled by an elevated rim of solid tufa resembles an immense cauldron the seething bubbling contents covered with steam are five feet below the rim the disgusting appearance of this spring is scarcely atoned for by the wonder with which it fills the beholder the other two springs much smaller but presenting the same general features are located near a large sulphur spring of milder temperature but too hot for bathing on the brow of an adjacent hillock amid the green pines heated vapour issues in scorching jets from several craters and fissures passing over the hill we struck a small stream of perfectly transparent water flowing from a cavern the roof of which tapers back to the water which is boiling furiously at a distance of twenty feet from the mouth and is ejected through it in uniform jets of great force the sides and entrance of the cavern are covered with soft green sediment which renders the rock on which it is deposited as soft and pliable as putty about two hundred yards from this cave is a most singular phenomenon which we call the muddy geyser it presents a funnel-shaped orifice in the midst of a basin one hundred and fifty feet in diameter with sloping sides of clay and sand the crater or orifice at the surface is thirty by fifty feet in diameter it tapers quite uniformly to the depth of about thirty feet where the water may be seen when the geyser is in repose presenting a surface of six or seven feet in breadth the flow of this geyser is regular every six hours the water rises gradually commencing to boil when about halfway to the surface and occasionally breaking forth in great violence when the crater is filled it is expelled from it in a splashing scattered mass ten or fifteen feet in thickness to the height of forty feet the water is of a dark lead colour and deposits the substance it holds in solution in the form of miniature stalagmites upon the sides and top of the crater as this was the first object which approached a geyser we naturally enough regarded it with intense curiosity the deposit contained in the water of this geyser comprises about one fifteenth of its bulk and an analysis of it made by professor augustus Steitz of montana gives the following result silica thirty six point seven alumina fifty two point four oxide of iron one point eight oxide of calcium three point two oxide of magnesia one point eight soda and potassa four point one and one hundred while returning by a new route to our camp dull thundering sounds which general washburn likened to frequent discharges of a distant mortar broke upon our ears we followed their direction and found them to proceed from a mud volcano which occupied the slope of a small hill embowered in a grove of pines dense volumes of steam shot into the air with each report through a crater thirty feet in diameter the reports though irregular occurred as often as every five seconds and could be distinctly heard half a mile each alternate report shook the ground a distance of two hundred yards or more and the massive jets of vapour which accompanied them burst forth like the smoke of burning gunpowder it was impossible to stand on the edge of that side of the crater opposite the wind and one of our party mr hedges was rewarded for his temerity in venturing too near the rim by being thrown by the force of the volume of steam violently down the outer side of the crater from hasty views afforded by occasional gusts of wind we could see at a depth of sixty feet the regurgitating contents 
this volcano as is evident from the freshness of the vegetation and the particles of dried clay adhering to the topmost branches of the trees surrounding it is of very recent formation probably it burst forth but a few months ago its first explosion must have been terrible we saw limbs of trees a hundred and twenty-five feet high encased in clay and found its scattered contents two hundred feet from it we closed this day's labor by a visit to several other springs so like those already described that they require no special notice to be continued end of part two part three of yellowstone national park six early pieces by various this librivox recording is in the public domain part three the wonders of the yellowstone part two section one the writer in company with general washburn rode back three miles the next morning to resurvey crater hill and the spring in its vicinity the large sulphur spring was overflowing and boiling with greater fury than on the previous visit the water occasionally leaping ten feet high on our return we followed the trail of the train fording the river a short distance above the camp here we found the first evidence since leaving butler's that the country had been long ago visited by trappers and hunters it was a bank of earth two feet high presenting an angle to the river ingeniously concealed by interwoven willows thus forming a rifle pit from which the occupant without discovery could bring down geese ducks swans pelicans and the numerous furred animals with which the river abounds nearby we stopped a moment to examine another spring of boiling mud and then pursued our route over hills covered with artemisia sagebrush through ravines and small meadows into a dense forest of pines filled with prostrate trunks which had piled upon each other for years to the height of many feet our passage of two miles through this forest to the bank of the lake unmarked by any trail was accomplished with great difficulty but the view which greeted us at its close was amply compensatory there lay the silvery bosom of the lake reflecting the beams of the setting sun and stretching away for miles until lost in the dark foliage of the interminable wilderness of pines surrounding it secluded amid the loftiest peaks of the rocky mountains eight thousand three hundred and thirty seven feet above the level of the ocean possessing strange peculiarities of form and beauty this watery solitude is one of the most attractive natural objects in the world its southern shore indented with long narrow inlets not unlike the frequent fjords of iceland bears testimony to the awful upheaval and tremendous force of the elements which resulted in its creation the long pine-crowned promontories stretching into it from the base of the hills lend new and charming features to an aquatic scene full of novelty and splendor islands of emerald hue dot its surface and a margin of sparkling sand forms its jewelled setting the winds compressed in their passage through the mountain gorges lash it into a sea as terrible as the fretted ocean covering it with foam but now it lay before us calm and unruffled save by the gentle wavelets which broke in murmurs along the shore water one of the grandest elements of scenery never seemed so beautiful before it formed a fitting climax to all the wonders we had seen and we gazed upon it for hours entranced with its increasing attractions this lake is about twenty-five miles long and seventy-five or eighty in circumference doubtless it was once the mighty crater of an immense volcano it is filled with trout some of gigantic size and peculiar delicacy waterfowl in great variety dot in flocks its mirrored surface the forests surrounding it are filled with deer elk mountain sheep and lesser game and in the mountain fastnesses the terrible grizzly and formidable amis make their lairs 
in form it was by one of our party not inaptly compared to a human hand with the fingers extended and spread as much as possible the main portion of the lake is the northern which would represent the palm of the hand there is a large southwest bay nearly cut off that would represent the thumb while there are about the same number of narrow southern inlets as there are fingers on the hand enclosing this watery palm is a dense forest of pines until now untraversed by man it was filled with trunks of trees in various stages of decay which had been prostrated by the mountain blasts rendering it almost impassable but as the beach of the lake was in many places impracticable there was no alternative but to recede altogether or work our way through it our course for the first six miles lay along the beach passing a number of hot sulphur springs and lukewarm ponds three steam jets from encrusted apertures discharged with a hissing noise resembling the sound of steam escaping from an engine the water of the lake was thoroughly impregnated with sulphur and the edges at a distance of twenty to fifty feet from the beach bubbled with springs which like those on the bank discharged through pipes of siliceous sinter these pipes though completely submerged were intensely hot while the water of the lake was too cold for a pleasant bath at one point along the shore are scattered curiously wrought objects of slate varying in size from a gold dollar to a locomotive we gathered specimens of cups which had been hollowed out by the elements discs long pestles resemblances to legs and feet and many other objects which nature in her most capricious mood had scattered over this watery solitude so strikingly similar were many of these configurations to works of art that a fanciful old trapper who had seen them told us that we would find on the borders of the lake the drinking cups stone war clubs and remains of the idols of an extinct race which had once dwelt there these are doubtless the joint production of fire and water the former roughly fashioning and the latter beautifully polishing and depositing them where they could be easily obtained we gave to this locality the name of curiosity point and added to our collection a number of specimens from its ample store ascending the plateau from the beach we became at once involved in all the intricacies of a primeval wilderness of pines difficulties increased with our progress through it severely trying the amiability of every member of the company our pack-horses would frequently get wedged between the trees or caught in the traps of a network of fallen trunks from which labour patience and ingenuity were severely taxed to extricate them the ludicrous sometimes came to our relief proving that there was nothing so effectual in allaying excitement as hearty laughter we had a remarkable pony in our pack-train which from the moment we entered the forest by his numerous acrobatic performances and mishaps furnished amusement for the company one part of the process of travel through this forest could only be accomplished by leaping over the fallen trunks an exploit which with all the spirit needful for the purpose our little bronco lacked the power always to perform as a consequence he was frequently found with the feet half accomplished resting upon the midriff his fore and hind feet suspended over the opposite sides of some huge log his ambition to excel was only equalled by the patience he exhibited in difficulty on one occasion while clambering a steep rocky ascent his head overtopping his haunches he literally performed three of the most wonderful backward head springs ever recorded in equine history a continued experience of this kind after three weeks toilsome travel found him as sound as on the day of its commencement and we dubbed him the little invulnerable after fifteen miles of unvarying toil we emerged from the forest to the pebbly beach of the lake here we found carnelians agates and chalcedony in abundance the lake was rolling tumultuously its crested waves rising at least four feet high the scene was very beautiful and exhilarating 
our route the next day was divided between the beach of the lake and the forest and so much impeded by fallen timber that we travelled but ten miles part of this distance was along the base of a brimstone basin which stretched from the lake to a semicircular range of mountains in company with lieutenant doane the rider ascended this range traversing its slopes a distance of three or four miles and found it covered halfway to the summit with a mixture of carbonate of lime and flowers of sulphur exhalations issuing from all parts of the surface impregnated the atmosphere with strong sulphurous odours small rivulets of warm water holding sulphur in solution coursed their way down the mountain uniting at its foot in a considerable stream the surface over which we rode was strongly encrusted and sounded hollow beneath the tread of our horses it was filled with vents and fissures surrounded with sulphur deposits nearly washed away this mountain exhibited the same general phenomena as crater hill though not in an equal state of activity our course during the two following days was nearly southeast on a line parallel with the wind river mountains that remarkable range which forms so conspicuous a feature in mr irving's astoria and bonneville's adventures the faint outline of their distant peaks had been visible on the northeastern horizon for several days on our right seventy-five miles distance were the towering summits of the three tetons the great landmarks of the snake river valley the close of the day on september sixth found us near the southeastern arm of the lake into which a large river flows the ground was low and marshy and being unable to find a fording place we were compelled to make our camp at the base of a range of bluffs half a mile away during the night we were startled by the shrill and almost human scream of an ammus or mountain lion which sounded uncomfortably near this terrible animal is much larger than the panther of the eastern forests but greatly resembles it in shape colour and ferocity it is the terror of mountaineers and furnishes them with the staple for many tales full of daring exploits early the next morning our commander and several others left camp in search of a ford while the rider and lieutenant doan started in the direction of a lofty mountain from the summit of which we expected to obtain a satisfactory observation of the southern shore of the lake at the expiration of two hours we reached a point in the ascent too precipitous for further equestrian travel dismounting we led our horses for an hour longer up the steep side of the mountain pausing every few moments to take breath until we arrived at the line of perpetual snow here we unsaddled and hitched our horses and climbed the apex to its summit passing over a mass of congealed snow more than thirty feet in thickness the ascent occupied four hours we were more than six hundred feet above the snow line and by barometric calculations eleven thousand three hundred and fifty feet above the ocean level the grandeur and vast extent of the view from this elevation beggar description the lake and valley surrounding it lay seemingly at our feet within jumping distance beyond them we saw with great distinctness the jets of the mud volcano and geyser but beyond all these stretching away into a horizon of cloud-defined mountains was the entire wind river range revealing in the sunlight the dark recesses gloomy canyons stupendous precipices and glancing pinnacles which everywhere dotted its jagged slopes lofty peaks shot up in gigantic spires from the main body of the range glittering in the sunbeams like solid crystal the mountain on which we stood was the most westerly peak of a range which in long extended volume swept to the southeastern horizon exhibiting a continuous elevation more than thirty miles in width its central line broken into countless points knobs glens and defiles all on the most colossal scale of grandeur and magnificence outside of these on either border along the entire range lofty peaks rose at intervals seemingly vying with each other in the varied splendours they presented to the beholder the scene was full of majesty 
the valley at the base of this range was dotted with small lakes and cloven centrally by the river which in the far distance we could see emerging from a canyon of immense dimensions within the shade of which two enormous jets of steam shot to an incredible height into the atmosphere this range of mountains has a marvellous history as it is the loftiest so it is the most remarkable lateral ridge of the rocky range the indians regard it as the crest of the world and among the blackfeet there is a fable that he who attains its summit catches a view of the land of souls and beholds the happy hunting grounds spread out below him brightening with the abodes of the free and generous spirits in the expedition sent across the continent by mr astor in eighteen eleven under command of captain wilson p hunt that gentleman met with the first serious obstacle to his progress at the base of this range after numerous efforts to scale it he turned away and followed the valley of the snake encountering the most discouraging disasters until he arrived at astoria later in eighteen thirty three the indomitable captain bonneville was lost in this mountain labyrinth and after devising various modes of escape finally determined to ascend the range selecting one of the highest peaks in company with one of his men mr irving says quote, after much toil he reached the summit of a lofty cliff but it was only to behold gigantic peaks rising all around and towering far into the snowy regions of the atmosphere he soon found that he had undertaken a tremendous task but the pride of man is never more obstinate than when climbing mountains the ascent was so steep and rugged that he and his companions were frequently obliged to clamber on hands and knees with their guns slung upon their backs frequently exhausted with fatigue and dripping with perspiration they threw themselves upon the snow and took handfuls of it to allay their parching thirst at one place they even stripped off their coats and hung them upon the bushes and thus lightly clad proceeded to scramble over these eternal snows as they ascended still higher there were cool breezes that refreshed and braced them and springing with new ardour to their task they at length attained the summit as late as eighteen sixty captain reynolds the commander of the expedition sent by government to explore the yellowstone from his camp at the base of this formidable range writes quote, to our front and upon the right the mountains towered above us to the height of from three to five thousand feet in the shape of bold craggy peaks of balsatic formation their summits crowned with glistening snow it was my original desire to go from the head of wind river to the head of the yellowstone keeping on the atlantic slope thence down the yellowstone passing the lake and across by the gallatin to the three forks of the missouri bridger said at the outset that this would be impossible and that it would be necessary to pass over to the headwaters of the columbia and back again to the yellowstone i had not previously believed that crossing the main crest twice would be more easily accomplished than the transit over what was in effect only a spur but the view from our present camp head of wind river settled the question adversely to my opinion at once directly across our route lies a balsatic ridge rising not less than five thousand feet above us its walls apparently vertical with no visible pass or even canyon on the opposite side of this are the headwaters of the yellowstone End quote. we were an hour and a half making the descent of the mountain at its base we struck the trail of our pack train which we followed to a point where the direction it had taken would have been lost but for the foresight of one of our companions who had formed a tripod of poles one of which longer than the others pointed to the right obeying this indian indication we descended the bank and crossed the bottom to the river fording which we followed the trail through a beautiful pine forest free from undergrowth and other obstructions the distance of a mile 
here night overtook us and mistaking for the trail a dark serpentine line we soon found ourselves clambering up the side of a steep mountain the conviction that we were following a band of indians and possibly were near their lodges suggested no pleasant reflections alighting from our horses we built a fire upon the track and carefully examining it could not find the impression of a single horseshoe further investigation revealed the fact that we had been for some time pursuing the path worn by a gang of elk that had crossed the trail of the pack train since the twilight set in a night on the mountain without supper or blankets was not to be endured we retraced our route to the base of the mountain and struck out boldly in the darkness for the beach of the lake where we supposed our party had camped our ride through fallen timber and morass until we reached the shore was performed more skilfully than if we had seen the obstacles which lay in our path we reached the lake in safety and after a ride of two miles on the smooth beach rounded a point from which we saw the welcome watch-fire of our company a loud halloo was responded to by a dozen sympathetic voices showing that our anxiety had been shared by our companions our camp was on the eastern inlet of the south shore of the lake distant but four miles from the camp of the preceding night thirteen miles of toilsome travel zigzagged into only seven of progress found us encamped at the close of the next day two miles from the mouth of a small stream flowing into the lake our party was separated nearly all day searching for roots two members after suffering all the early sensations incident to a conviction of being lost in the wilderness came into camp at a late hour full of glee at their good fortune at one of their halts after they had dismounted to reconnoitre a huge grizzly jumped at one of them from the bushes frightening his horse so that he broke his bridle and ran away they caught him with difficulty our commander and mr hauser in company while seeking a route for future travel came suddenly upon a female grizzly and two cubs about half a mile from camp on their return six of the party started in pursuit but madame brune meanwhile had made good her retreat our journey of five miles the next day was accomplished with great difficulty and annoyance almost the entire distance was through a forest piled full of fallen trunks travelling was but another name for scrambling and as man is at times the least amiable of animals our tempers frequently displayed alarming activity not only towards the patient creatures laden with our stores but towards each other once while involved in the reticulated meshes of a vast net of branches and tree-tops each man with varied expletive emphasis clamorously insisting upon a particular mode of extrication a member of the party who was always jolly restored us to instant good humour by repeating in theatrical tones and manner those beautiful lines from child harold there is a pleasure in the pathless woods there is a rapture on the lonely shore our little invulnerable too was the unconscious cause of many bursts of laughter which like the appreciative plaudits of an audience came in at the right time we were glad however at an early hour in the afternoon to pitch our tent on one of the small tributaries of snake river three miles distant from the lake in the search made by every member of the party for roots our company was unavoidably much scattered our first care being for the pack train when it came up we missed therefrom the little animal whose frequent mishaps had been to us all a source of so much amusement an instant search was instituted and at a late hour we found him three miles from camp he saluted us with a low neigh and with hurried pace soon rejoined his companions one of our comrades the hon truman c everts late u s assessor of montana had failed to come up with the rest of the company but as this was a common circumstance we gave it little heed until the lateness of the hour convinced us he had lost his way we increased our fire and fired our guns as signals but all to no purpose 
it had been a sort of tacit agreement among us only the night before that should any one get parted from the company we would at once go to the southwest arm of the lake that being our objective point and await there the arrival of the train the belief that we should find our companion there hastened us into the commission of an error which was designed by all as a measure of speedy relief if we had not continued our journey with all possible expedition towards the point indicated mr everts would probably have joined us within three or four days as he has informed us since that he visited our camp but the falling foliage of the pines had entirely obliterated our departing trail the narrative of this gentleman of thirty-seven days spent in this terrible wilderness will furnish a chapter in the history of human endurance exposure and escape as incredible as it must be painfully instructive and entertaining seven miles of struggling took us through the timber to another inlet five miles further on our way no sign of our missing comrade we built a large fire on a commanding ridge and ascended a mountain overlooking the north and west shores of the lake where we kindled another fire which could be seen at a great distance eight hundred feet above yellowstone lake nestled in a dark mountain glen we found two small lakes completely environed with frightful masses of basalt and brown lava seemingly thrown up and scattered by some terrible convulsion two of our company took the backward trail at night searching for mr everts and our anxieties were greatly increased lest they too should meet with some disaster we rose early the next morning after passing a sleepless night while at breakfast our two companions came in they had followed the beach to a point east of our camp of two days before and found no trace of mr everts more than ever assured that we should find him at the west arm of the lake we struck out for that point three of our party mr hauser lieutenant doane and myself in advance to explore a route for the train and make all possible search by the way we posted notices on the trees to indicate the route we had taken and made caches of provisions at several points late in the afternoon at the close of a fatiguing day's travel mostly through forest we arrived at our objective point and were greatly distressed to find there no trace of our lost friend while gathered around our campfire in the evening devising a plan for more systematic search our ears were saluted with a screech so terribly human that for a moment supposing it to be our missing comrade we hallooed in response and would have started to his relief but that a minatory growl warned us of the near approach of a mountain lion three parties of two each struck out the next morning in different directions in pursuit of our companion one followed the lake shore one the back trail through the forest and the third southerly from the lake to a large brown mountain the party following the lake shore returned to camp early in the afternoon with the report that they had seen indians the story of their adventures written by one of them runs thus Quote, he and his companion having penetrated several miles through the inhospitable wilds of that region dismounted and unsaddled their horses mr t commenced to fish and prepare them a little dinner while mr s went ahead with his gun to continue the search on foot the former had just caught four fishes and kindled a fire when the latter returned in some haste but perfectly cool and self-possessed and stated that there were six indians on a point jutting out into the lake about a mile distance they concluded that neither had a mouth for fish which they left sweltering in the noonday sun and saddling their horses they advanced towards the foe mr s saw them distinctly but mr t could not probably because he was somewhat near-sighted finally the former gentleman saw them flitting phantom-like among the rocks and trees at which juncture the party retired to camp in platoons and in good order at the rate of a mile in every three minutes this tribe of indians being one of the curiosities of the expedition and hitherto unknown was named after the person who discovered it both of the other parties returned after a fruitless search 
in their trip to the brown mountain the two who went south crossed the main range of the rocky mountains through a very low pass which on the western side terminated in a brimstone basin containing forty or fifty sulphur and mud springs and a large number of craters from which issued jets of vapour this slope of the mountain was covered with a hollow incrustation through which the water from the springs percolating in different channels had spread out over the little patches of soil with which they came in contact covering them with bright green verdure in crossing one of these the horse of one of the party broke through to his haunches and being extricated he plunged more deeply into another trap throwing headlong his rider whose arm as he fell was thrust violently through the treacherous surface into the scalding morass from complete submersion in which both men and beast were with great difficulty saved at the base of the brown mountain the party saw a lake of considerable size which they believed to be the headwaters of snake river the lewis fork of the columbia they could not approach it nearer than a mile on account of the treacherous character of the soil the other party were absent two days they had visited all the camps of the six preceding days following the trail between them mostly obliterated by the falling foliage of the pines with great difficulty but without discovering the slightest indication that mr everts had come upon it on full consultation we came to the conclusion that he had either been shot from his horse by an indian or had returned down the yellowstone or struck out upon some of the headwaters of snake river with the intention of following it to the settlements it was agreed that we should pursue the search three days longer from this point before renewing our journey snow began to fall early in the evening through the hazy atmosphere we beheld on the shore of the inlet opposite our camp the steam ascending in jets from more than fifty craters giving it much the appearance of a new england factory village End of part three part four of yellowstone national park six early pieces by various this librivox recording is in the public domain part four the wonders of the yellowstone part two section two snow continued to fall all night and the next day and we made our camp as comfortable as possible at night the snow was more than two feet deep it turned to rain the following morning showers alternated with sunshine through the day removed the snow rapidly we were now so completely environed by forest and so far away from any recognized trail that all our fear of molestation by indians or of danger from any other cause was thoroughly dissipated with true falstaffian philosophy we felt that we could take our ease in our inn and the figure one of us presented has been graphically delineated by our artist upon the spot we made a circuit round the head of the inlet to the springs we had seen the next day they were widely different from any we had visited before in all they numbered a hundred and fifty and were scattered along the lake shore about a mile at a distance of a hundred yards from the beach those farthest inland resembled boiling mud of various degrees of consistency some not thicker than paint others so dense that as they boiled over the contents piled into heaps which gradually spread over the ground forming an extensive vitrified surface this sediment varies in colour that flowing from some of the apertures being white as chalk that from others of a delicate lavender hue and from others of a brilliant pink colour the following are the results of analyses of the various specimens which we gathered by professor augustus Stites of montana here follows a table which the reader has not reproduced in close proximity to these springs are others of pure odourless water near the shore were several boiling springs around which the sedimentary increment had formed into mounds of various sizes and heights the deposit around one of these springs resembles a miniature forest of pines the most remarkable springs of this group 
six or seven in number are of pure ultramarine hue very large and wonderfully transparent the largest is forty feet wide by seventy feet long the sides are funnel-shaped converging regularly to the depth of forty feet where they present a dark and apparently unfathomable chasm from the surface to this opening the sides of the funnel are furrowed and sinuous coated with a white sediment which contrasts vividly with the dark orifice at its base this group of springs exhibit in their deposits a great variety of shades and colours no two of them being alike their constant overflow has fashioned a concrete bank of commingled tufa eight feet in height and a quarter of a mile in length and on the margin of the lake the waves have worn this bank into large caverns which respond in hollow murmurs to their fierce assaults between the springs are numerous vents and craters from which heated vapour is constantly rising along the edge of the water and ten or twenty feet from shore many springs are bubbling none of which seem to be strongly impregnated with sulphur the beach for a mile or more is strewn with fragments of sinter of various colours which have been worn by the waves into many fantastic forms the five days during which we camped at this locality were occupied by every possible effort to find our missing friend but the labours of each day only served to increase our fears for his safety one hope that of meeting him at virginia city was still indulged but opposed to this were many painful conjectures as to his possible fate not the least prevalent of which was the one that he might have been shot from an ambush by an indian arrow our provisions were rapidly diminishing and our longer stay gave promise of unfavourable results the force of circumstances obliged us to adopt the gloomy alternative of moving forward the next day leaving one of our own party and two of the cavalrymen to prosecute a further search the loss of our comrade and friend was to us all a source of much unhappy reflection and the hope of finding him so entirely absorbed our attention that we had little curiosity to examine and so escaped very many of the wonders of this region which we should otherwise have seen in our constant passing to and fro in different directions through the forest along the lake and over the surrounding mountains we had glances of objects which had we been free from a heavy charge it would have been pleasant to visit and describe these however are reserved for future investigation the plan of our route led us in a northwesterly direction from the lake towards the headwaters of the madison we travelled through a dense pine forest unmarked by trails and encumbered by fallen timber for most of the distance the close of the first day's travel found us only twelve miles from the lake still in the midst of the deep snow with no place to pitch our tent and each man seeking unsuccessfully a dry spot whereon to spread his blankets under the shelter of the trees the next day we reached the east bank of the firehole river the largest tributary of the madison down which we travelled passing several cascades many craters and boiling springs to a large basin two miles above the point of the union of the fire hole and burnt hole rivers we bade adieu to yellowstone lake surfeited with the wonders we had seen and in the belief that the interesting portion of our journey was over the desire for home had superseded all thought of further exploration we had seen the greatest wonders on the continent and were convinced that there was not on the globe another region where within the same limits nature had crowded so much of grandeur and majesty with so much of novelty and wonder our only care was to return home as rapidly as possible three days of active travel from the headwaters of the madison would find us among the settlers in the beautiful lower valley of that picturesque river and within twelve miles of virginia city where we hoped to meet with mr everts and realize afresh that all is well that ends well judge then what must have been our astonishment as we entered the basin at mid-afternoon of our second day's travel to see in the clear sunlight at no great distance an immense volume of clear sparkling water projected into the air to the height of one hundred and twenty-five feet geysers 
geysers exclaimed one of our company and spurring our jaded horses we soon gathered around this wonderful phenomenon it was indeed a perfect geyser the aperture through which the jet was projected was an irregular oval three feet by seven feet in diameter the margin of centre was curiously piled up and the exterior crust was filled with little hollows full of water in which were small globules of sediment some having gathered around bits of wood and other nuclei this geyser is elevated thirty feet above the level of the surrounding plain and the crater rises five or six feet above the mound it spouted at regular intervals nine times during our stay the columns of boiling water being thrown from ninety to one hundred and twenty five feet at each discharge which lasted from fifteen to twenty minutes we gave it the name of old faithful in our journey down the valley looking down through a crevice in the crust upon which we were travelling we discovered a stream of hot water of considerable size running nearly at right angles with and away from the firehole river on the summit of a cone twenty feet high was a boiling spring seven feet in diameter surrounded with beautiful incrustations on the slope of which we gathered twigs and pine tree cones encased in a siliceous crust a quarter of an inch in thickness but all of the curiosities of this basin sink into insignificance in comparison with the geysers we saw during our brief stay of but twenty-two hours twelve in action six of these from vents varying from three to five feet in diameter threw water to the height of from fifteen to twenty-five feet but in the presence of others of immense dimensions these soon ceased to attract attention one which we named the fan has an orifice which discharges two radiating jets of water to the height of sixty feet the falling drops and spray resembling a feather fan it is very beautiful its eruptions are very frequent lasting usually from ten to thirty minutes a vent connected with it about forty feet distant expels dense masses of vapour fifty or sixty feet high accompanied by loud sharp reports during the time the geyser is in action the grotto was so named from its singular crater of vitrified centre full of large sinuous apertures through one of these on our first visit one of our company crawled to the discharging orifice and when a few hours afterwards he saw a volume of boiling water four feet in diameter shooting through it to the height of sixty feet and a scalding stream of two hundred inches flowing from the aperture he had entered a short time before he concluded he had narrowly escaped being summarily cooked the discharge of this geyser continued for nearly half an hour the castle situated on the summit of an encrusted mound has a turreted crater through which a large volume of water is expelled at intervals of two or three hours to the height of fifty feet from a discharging orifice about three feet in diameter the architectural features of the siliceous centre surrounding it which is very massive and compact indicating that at some former period the flow of water must have been much greater than at present suggested its name a vent near it is constantly discharging a large stream of boiling water and when the geyser is in action the water in this vent boils and bubbles with great fierceness the giant has a rugged crater ten feet in diameter on the outside with an irregular orifice five or six feet in diameter it discharges a vast body of water and the only time we saw it in eruption the flow of water in a column five feet in diameter and one hundred and forty feet in vertical height continued uninterruptedly for nearly three hours the crater resembles a miniature model of the Colosseum. our search for new wonders leading us across the firehole river we ascended a gentle encrusted slope and came suddenly upon a large oval aperture with scalloped edges the diameters of which were eighteen and twenty-five feet the sides corrugated and covered with a greyish-white siliceous deposit which was distinctly visible at the depth of one hundred feet below the surface no water could be discovered but we could distinctly hear it gurgling and boiling at a great distance below suddenly it began to rise boiling and 
spluttering and sending out huge masses of steam causing a general stampede of our company driving us some distance from our point of observation when within about forty feet of the surface it became stationary and we returned to look down upon it it was foaming and surging at a terrible rate occasionally emitting small jets of hot water nearly to the mouth of the orifice all at once it seemed seized with a fearful spasm and rose with incredible rapidity hardly affording us time to flee to a safe distance when it burst from the orifice with terrific momentum rising in a column the full size of this immense aperture to the height of sixty feet and through and out of the apex of this vast aqueous mass five or six lesser jets or round columns of water varying in size from six to fifteen inches in diameter were projected to the marvellous height of two hundred and fifty feet these lesser jets so much higher than the main column and shooting through it doubtless proceed from auxiliary pipes leading into the principal orifice near the bottom where the explosive force is greater if the theory that water by constant boiling becomes explosive when freed from air be true this theory rationally accounts for all irregularities in the eruptions of the geysers this grand eruption continued for twenty minutes and was the most magnificent sight we ever witnessed we were standing on the side of the geyser nearest the sun the gleams of which filled the sparkling column of water and spray with myriads of rainbows whose arches were constantly changing dipping and fluttering hither and thither and disappearing only to be succeeded by others again and again amid the aqueous column while the minute globules into which the spent jets were diffused when falling sparkled like a shower of diamonds and around every shadow which the denser clouds of vapour interrupting the sun's rays cast upon the column could be seen a luminous circle radiant with all the colours of the prism and resembling the halo of glory represented in paintings as encircling the head of divinity all that we had previously witnessed seemed tame in comparison with the perfect grandeur and beauty of this display two of these wonderful eruptions occurred during the twenty-two hours we remained in the valley this geyser we named the giantess a hundred yards distant from the giantess was a siliceous cone very symmetrical but slightly corrugated upon its exterior surface three feet in height and five feet in diameter at its base and having an oval orifice twenty-four by thirty-six and one-half inches in diameter with scalloped edges not one of our company supposed that it was a geyser and among so many wonders it had almost escaped notice while we were at breakfast upon the morning of our departure a column of water entirely filling the crater shot from it which by accurate triangular measurement we found to be two hundred and nineteen feet in height the stream did not deflect more than four or five degrees from a vertical line and the eruption lasted eighteen minutes we named it the beehive how many more geysers there are in this locality it would be impossible to conjecture our waning stores admonished us of the necessity for a hurried departure and we reluctantly left this remarkable region less than half explored in this basin which is about two miles in length and one mile in width more than a thousand pipes or wells rise to the surface varying in diameter from two to one hundred and twenty feet the water in which varies in temperature from a hundred and forty degrees to the boiling point upwards of a hundred of which give evidence by the calcareous and siliceous deposits surrounding them that they are geysers and to all appearances they are as likely to be as any we saw in action the sides of these wells were covered with siliceous incrustations and were funnel-shaped and in many of the larger ones gradually converged for a distance of from twenty to fifty feet from the edge below which point the apertures enlarged laterally in all directions like a jug below the neck and were apparently unfathomable none of the springs in this locality appear to be impregnated with sulphur 
in this basin there are to be found no mud springs of which we discovered so many in the valley of the yellowstone and we found but one spring of cold water this entire country is seemingly under a constant and active internal pressure from volcanic forces which seek relief through the numberless springs jets volcanoes and geysers exhibited on its surface and which but for these vents might burst forth in one terrific eruption and form a volcano of vast dimensions it is undoubtedly true that many of the objects we saw were of recent formation and that many of the extinguished craters recently ceased their condition of activity they are constantly breaking forth often assuming new forms and attesting to the active presence of volcanic force a mountaineer who visited a portion of this region a year ago found at one place a small volcano which was constantly overflowing with liquid sulphur and lava and emitting smoke showing that the genuine volcanic elements were there and needed but the concentration of the forces now dissipated through thousands of vents to present a spectacle of grandeur surpassing that of vesuvius or etna the geyser is a new and perhaps the most remarkable feature in our scenery and physical history it is found in no other countries but ireland and tibet the geysers of the country last named are inconsiderable when compared with either those of iceland or the firehole or madison basin and those of iceland even dwindle into significance by the side of those of the madison until the discovery of the madison geysers there were but two of any note known to the world the great geyser and the stoker of iceland the phenomena presented by these have been sufficient at various periods during the past century to invite the personal investigation of some of the most distinguished of european savants von troll stanley olson hooker mackenzie and at a later day bunsen have visited iceland for the purpose of witnessing these aqueous eruptions and forming some satisfactory conclusion relative to the causes in which they originate the theory published by sir george mackenzie that the outbursts were produced by pressure on the air contained in cavernous recesses underground for many years received the sanction of the scientific world the periods intervening between the eruptions of the great geyser of iceland have been very irregular until within the past forty or fifty years since when it has generally projected a small jet to the height of twenty feet every two hours and a large one to the height of eighty feet every six hours mackenzie's theory was that there were two subterranean cavities connected with the main pipe one much deeper and larger than the other which rapidly filled with water after each eruption and that the pressure of the vapors upon them produced these periodic explosions ingenious as this theory appeared to be it was dissipated by the experiments made upon water by mr doney of ghent he discovered that water long boiled became more and more free from air by which its molecular cohesion is so greatly increased and that when it is exposed to a heat sufficient to overcome the force of cohesion the production of steam is so instantaneous and so considerable as to cause explosion bunsen ascribes the eruption of the geysers to this cause he found the water at the bottom of the well of the great geyser to be of a constantly increasing temperature up to the moment of an eruption on one occasion it was as high as two hundred and sixty one degrees fahrenheit his idea is that on reaching some unknown point above that temperature ebullition takes place vapor is suddenly generated in enormous quantities and an eruption of the superior column of water is the consequence the geysers of the madison exhibit precisely the same physical features and doubtless originate in the same causes they are surrounded too as are those of iceland by innumerable springs of hot water the bursting of a column into millions of particles resembles an explosion more than a mere eruption and the vast clouds of vapour which enshroud them and mingle with them in their ascent sometimes give an appearance of bulk to the upper part of the columns much greater than their real magnitude 
the water of the madison geysers like that of the geysers of iceland appears perfectly pure and doubtless could be used for cooking or drinking we had not the means of analyzing it on the spot the center was both carboniferous and siliceous the latter characteristic predominating but both prevailing sufficiently to have produced large encrusted mounds and numerous illustrations of petrification in various stages of progress all this where such immense volumes of water are being constantly ejected could be effected with a moderate infusion of silica or soda dr black gives the following result of an analysis of a quantity of ten thousand grains about one-sixth of a gallon of water from the great geyser of iceland soda point ninety five alumina point forty eight silica five point four o muriate of soda two point four six dry sulphate of soda one point four six total ten point seven five that the same elements are held in solution in the waters of the madison geysers we have abundant proof in the vast encrusted field by which they are surrounded they are but a reproduction upon a much grander scale of the phenomena of iceland a wider field for the investigation of the chemist than that presented by the geysers may be found in the many tinted springs of boiling mud and the mud volcano these were objects of the greatest interest to humboldt who devotes to a description of them one of the most fascinating chapters of cosmos it would be rash in us to speculate where that great man hesitated we can only say that the field is open for exploration illimitable in resource grand in extent wonderful in variety in a climate favoured of heaven and amid scenery the most stupendous on the continent by means of the northern pacific railroad which will doubtless be completed within the next three years the traveller will be able to make the trip to montana from the atlantic seaboard in three days and thousands of tourists will be attracted to both montana and wyoming in order to behold with their own eyes the wonders here described besides these intervals of the upper yellowstone one may look upon the strange scenery of the lower valley of that great river the great falls of the missouri the grotesque groups of eroded rocks below fort benton the beautiful canyon of the prickly pear and the stupendous architecture of the vast chains and spurs of mountains which everywhere traverse that picturesque and beautiful country End of part four. part five of yellowstone national park six early pieces by various this librivox recording is in the public domain part five more about the yellowstone the interesting accounts that have been given in this monthly from time to time of the remarkable natural phenomena in the valley of the yellowstone have created a general interest throughout the country during the past summer the writer enjoyed unusual facilities for exploring this singular region and he gladly bears witness that the statements of mr langford were in no respect exaggerated indeed it is quite impossible for any one to do justice to the remarkable physical phenomena of this valley by any description however vivid it is only through the eye that the mind can form anything like an adequate conception of their beauty and grandeur we may make our story more clear to our readers if we take as our starting point fort ellis a beautiful frontier military post located near the head of the fertile valley of the gallatin by the great kindness of the officers of that post we were provided with all the outfit that was necessary for our adventurous journey to the yellowstone on the fifteenth of july last we commenced our winding way over the grassy hills that form the divide between the waters of the missouri and the yellowstone our course was nearly due east for about thirty miles when we came to the valley of the yellowstone and then we ascended the valley for ten miles farther and pitched our permanent camp near butler's ranch close to the lower canyon and at the farthest point to which it would be safe to go with our wagons from this point we changed our mode of travel to pack animals here began the more difficult part of our journey 
the whole party were filled with enthusiasm to catch a glimpse of the wonderful visions of which we had already heard so much opposite our camp were the yellowstone mountains with peaks rising twelve thousand feet above sea level and six thousand feet above the valley for beauty and symmetry of outline i have never seen this range equalled in the far west and several members of the party who were familiar with the mountains of central europe were struck at once with the resemblance to the alps but we will continue our way up the valley leaving behind us the lofty volcanic hills which wall us in on each side and enter the lower canyon here granite walls rise on either side to the height of a thousand feet or more and through the narrow gorge the river dashes with great velocity the bright green color of the water and the numerous ripples capped with white foam as the roaring torrent rushes around and over the multitude of rocks that have fallen from above into the channel give a most picturesque view to the eye as we look from our lofty heights not the least attractive feature and one that to us amounted to a wonder was the abundance of fine trout which the river afforded there seemed to be no limit to them and hundreds of pounds weight of the speckled beauties were caught by the different members of our party but we cannot linger here although the scenery is very attractive so we hasten on to the devil's slide or cinnabar mountain as it is usually called it is one of the singular freaks of nature which occur very seldom in the west is formed of alternate beds of sandstone limestone and quartzites elevated to a nearly vertical position by those internal forces which acted in ages past to lift the mountain ranges into their present heights as we stand at the base and look up the sides of the mountains we are filled with wonder at the apparent evidences of the convulsions of nature which could have thrown three thousand to five thousand feet in thickness of rocks into their present position ridge after ridge extends down the steep sides of the mountain like lofty walls the intervening softer portions having been washed away leaving the harder layers projecting far above at one locality the rocks incline in every possible direction and are crushed together in the utmost confusion between the walls at one point is a band of bright brick-red clay which has been mistaken for cinnabar and hence the name of the mountain the most conspicuous ridge is composed of basalt and the igneous material was poured out on the surface when all the rocks were in a horizontal position during the jurassic period indeed all the rocks are either of the carboniferous jurassic or cretaceous stage during the day we passed many examples of volcanic action which in any other region would have excited attention small lakes covered with wild fowl and fringed with a luxuriant growth of vegetation occupied the old volcanic craters on the evening of the third day as we came to the junction of gardner's river the warm springs began to appear near the edge of the stream the white calcareous deposit which always indicates that those springs do exist or have existed covered the bottom and from underneath this crust a stream poured a volume of water into the river six feet wide and two feet deep with a temperature of a hundred and thirty degrees a little farther up the stream were a number of hot springs of about the same temperature with nearly circular basins six to ten feet in diameter and two to four feet deep around them had already gathered a number of invalids who were living in tents and their praises were enthusiastic in favor of the sanitary effects of the springs some of them were used for drinking and others for bathing purposes from the river our path led up the steep sides of the hill for about one mile when we came suddenly and unexpectedly in full view of the springs this wonder alone our whole company agreed surpassed all the descriptions which had been given by former travellers indeed the langford party saw nothing of this before us arose a high white mountain looking precisely like a frozen cascade it is formed by the calcareous sediment of the hot springs precipitated from the water as it flows down the steep declivities of the mountain side the upper portion is about one thousand feet above the waters of gardner's river the surface covered with the deposit comprises from three to four square miles 
the springs now in active operation cover an area of about one square mile while the rest of the territory is occupied by the remains of springs which have long since ceased to flow we pitched our camp upon a grassy terrace at the base of the principal group of active springs just in the rear of us were a series of reservoirs or bathing pools rising one above the other semicircular in form with most elegantly scalloped margins composed of calcareous matter the sediment precipitated from the water of the spring the hill which is about two hundred feet high presents the appearance of water congealed by frost as it quickly flows down a rocky declivity the deposit is as white as snow except when tinged here and there with iron or sulphur small streams flow down the sides of the snowy mountain in channels lined with oxide of iron colored with the most delicate tints of red others present the most exquisite shades of yellow with a deep bright sulphur to a dainty cream color in the springs and in the little channels is a material like the finest cashmere wool with its slender fibres floating in the water vibrating with the movement of the current and tinged with various shades of red and yellow as bright as those of our aniline dyes these delicate wool-like masses are undoubtedly plants which seem to be abundant in all the hot springs of the west and are familiar to the microscopists as diatoms upon a kind of terrace covering an area of two hundred yards in length and fifteen in width are several large springs in a constant state of agitation but with a somewhat lower temperature than the boiling point the hottest spring is a hundred and sixty two degrees others are a hundred and forty two degrees a hundred and fifty five degrees and a hundred and fifty six degrees respectively some of them give off the odor of sulphurated hydrogen quite perceptibly a qualitative analysis shows the water to contain sulphurated hydrogen lime soda alumina and a small amount of magnesia it is beautifully clear and slightly alkaline to the taste the water after rising from the spring basins flows down the sides of the declivity step by step from one reservoir to the other at each one of them losing a portion of its heat until it becomes as cool as spring water within five hundred feet of its source our large party camped for two days by the side of the little stream formed by the aggregated waters of these hot springs and we found the water most excellent for drinking as well as cooking purposes it was perfectly clear and tasteless and harmless in its effects during our stay here all the members of our party as well as the soldiers comprising our escort enjoyed the luxury of bathing in these most elegantly carved natural bathing pools and it was easy to select from the hundreds of reservoirs water of every variety of temperature these natural basins vary somewhat in size but many of them are about four by six feet in diameter and one to four feet in depth with a foresight worthy of commendation two men have already preempted three hundred and twenty acres of land covering most of the surface occupied by the active springs with the expectation that upon the completion of the northern pacific railroad this will become a famous place of resort for invalids and pleasure-seekers indeed no future tourist in travelling over the far west will think of neglecting this most wonderful of the physical phenomena of that most interesting region the level or terrace upon which the principal active springs are located is about midway up the sides of the mountain covered with the sediment still farther up are the old ruins of what must have been at some period of the past even more active springs than any at present known the sides of the mountain for two or three hundred feet in height are covered with a thick crust of the calcareous deposit which was originally ornamented with the most elegant sculpturing all over the surface like the bathing pools below but atmospheric agencies which act readily on the lime have obliterated all their delicate beauty chimneys partially broken down are scattered about here and there with apertures varying in size from two inches to two feet in diameter long rounded ridges are also quite numerous with fissures extending the entire length from which the boiling water issued forth and flowed over the sides thus the sediment was continually precipitated in thin oval layers 
so that a section of these oblong chimneys presents the appearance of layers of hay in a stack or the thatched cabin of a peasant some of these chimneys were undoubtedly formed by geysers now extinct others by what may be called spouting springs as those which are in a constant state of violent ebullition throwing the water up two to four feet a phenomenon intermediate between a boiling spring and a true geyser the water is forced up through an orifice in the earth by hydrostatic pressure and overflowing precipitates the sediment around it and thus in time it builds up a mound varying in height according to the force of this pressure one of these cones is very remarkable surpassing any observed in any other portion of the west from its peculiar form we almost involuntarily named it the liberty cap it is entirely composed of carbonate of lime in flexible cap-like layers with a diameter at the base of fifteen feet and a height of about forty feet it is completely closed over at the summit this is probably an extinct geyser and was the most powerful one of this group sometimes the orifice is in the form of a fissure one hundred to three hundred feet in length and the mound built up by the deposition of the sediment will be of oblong shape as the mound rises the hydrostatic force diminishes until finally the spring entirely conceals itself at the summit and either becomes extinct or flows out through fissures in the sides classed with reference to their chemical constituents there are two kinds of springs in the valley of the yellowstone viz those in which lime predominates and those in which silica is most abundant in respect to beauty of form the calcareous springs build up monuments that far surpass the others the stalactites and beautiful fresco work of the mammoth cave of kentucky are precipitated from springs holding a great amount of lime in solution the remarkable forms which lime is caused to assume through the influence of water is well shown in all limestone regions the scenery in the vicinity of these hot springs is varied and beautiful beyond description i have already stated that they are located a thousand feet above the channel of the yellowstone and thus command a very extended view up and down the valley to the north the devil's slide can be distinctly seen while on either side the mountains rise to the height of two thousand feet enclosing the valley as with gigantic walls from the summit still higher piercing the clouds are numerous basaltic peaks presenting a great variety of unique forms to the eastward is the bluff wall composed of twelve hundred to fifteen hundred feet of strata revealing one of the most perfect geological sections observed in the west on the summit is a thick cap of basalt which extends up gardner's river and forms the floor over which the waters of the east middle and west forks of that stream flow and dash down in most beautiful cascades in the sides of the canyons of these branches are rows of basaltic columns as perfect as those so familiar to all who have visited fingal's cave in staffa in all my explorations in the far west i have never seen such exquisite exhibitions of this semi-crystallized structure between the middle and west forks stands the dome-like form of mount everts clothed with a dense growth of pines its summit covered with fragments of basalt from its top the view is grand reaching over a radius of fifty to one hundred miles in every direction on the west are the higher ranges of mountains about the sources of the gallatin and missouri forks with their loftiest peaks covered with perpetual snow we must not linger here however amid these impressive scenes but wind our way up the valley in search of more wonders these will meet us in rapid transition from step to step we can only stop a moment to glance at one of the greatest beauties of the valley tower falls or tower creek where the water makes a vertical descent of a hundred and fifty six feet on either side the sombre brecciated columns stand like gloomy sentinels but an excellent description of these falls has been given in a former number of this monthly near this point the grand canyon of the yellowstone river commences and continues about thirty miles to the great falls in some respects this canyon is the greatest wonder of all the river has carved out a channel through the basalt volcanic breccia and hot springs deposit 
one thousand to twelve hundred feet deep and one to two thousand feet in width at the bottom of which the water foams along with torrent-like rapidity but the striking feature of this remarkable view is the effect of colors derived from the hot spring deposits which have a brilliancy like the most delicate of our aniline dyes none but an artist with the most delicate perception of colors could do justice to the picture the well-known landscape painter thomas moran who is justly celebrated for his exquisite taste as a colorist exclaimed with a sort of regretful enthusiasm that these beautiful tents were beyond the reach of human art between the upper and lower falls a fine stream called cascade creek empties into the yellowstone standing upon the east margin of the canyon one can look up the channel of this little creek a few hundred feet and enjoy a full view of cascade falls which have given the name to the creek the water as it pours over a succession of basaltic steps separates into a number of little streams giving to the whole a most pleasing effect above the falls the river seems to flow quietly along over the surface but little below the general level and here it may be said to present some of its finest and most attractive views if below the falls this river surpasses all others in the west for its rugged grandeur above the falls it excels in picturesque beauty about half a mile above the falls on this creek the gorge is so narrow and deep that the traveller looks down from the margin above into an abyss so dark and forbidding that a very appropriate name comes almost involuntarily to one's lips the devil's den the sides of the gorge are very rugged composed of angular masses of basalt and obsidian cemented with volcanic ashes there is also a large amount of sulphur mingled with the ashes so that the debris looks like the remains of an old furnace on either side of the river as we ascend the valley are remarkable groups of hot springs there is a singular group on the south side of mount washburn which is well worthy of the attention of the traveller the deposit formed by these springs extends across the yellowstone river and occupies a large area most of these springs contain clear water but there are several which are called mud springs these mud springs do not differ in their origin from the others some are what may be called dead springs as those which have passed the period of their activity and now are filled with turbid water others are in a constant state of agitation and may be called living springs while others at certain periods throw out great quantities of mud and may be called mud geysers there is every grade from simply turbid water to thick mud the superficial deposits here are composed of basalts and hot spring deposits as silica and feldspar and as the aperture through which the hot water reaches the surface sometimes extends a considerable distance through this material it is dissolved from the sides of the passage and mingled with the boiling water becomes in due time much like boiling mush whenever the mud becomes so thick as to close up the orifice for any length of time a sort of explosion takes place which sometimes hurls masses of the mud to the height of fifty or one hundred feet at mud springs and crater mountains there are several of these mud springs with basins varying in size from a few inches to thirty feet in diameter mostly with circular rims and funnel-shaped orifices the most interesting of the mud springs occur in the valley of the fire hole creek some of them are filled with very black mud others a brownish clay but in a few instances the mud has the snowy whiteness which is due to the decomposition of the silica deposited from the hot waters to heighten the effect it is also tinged with the bright red from the oxide of iron some of these may be called alum springs from the fact that the mud is composed largely of alum sometimes there will be a group of fifteen or twenty of these little mud springs with orifices from two to six inches in diameter all of them operating at the same time with a low thud-like noise we make our first camp on the northeast shore of the lake near the point where the river takes its departure from it here we had one of the finest views of this beautiful sheet of water 
this portion of the lake is about ten miles wide our camp was located in a broad open meadow-like space with the grass two feet or more in height adorned with bright flowers having a great variety of colors a dense growth of pines surrounded it and to the eastward the range of forest-covered hills was twelve hundred to eighteen hundred feet above the lake at this place we launched our little boat which was destined to perform most excellent service we had transported the framework on the back of a mule from fort ellis we covered the frame with a heavy canvas which rendered it perfectly watertight and with this little craft twelve feet long three and a half feet wide and twenty-two inches high the entire length and breadth of the lake was navigated many times soundings of the lake were made in every direction and the greatest depth discovered was three hundred feet messrs elliott and carrington made a survey of the shore line from the boat and with the numerous bays and indentations they estimated the distance to be about one hundred and seventy five miles so far as beauty of scenery is concerned it is probable that this lake is not surpassed by any other on the globe there is not space in the present article to make more than this passing allusion to it but we hope at some future time to do more ample justice to this region and trust that the few isolated facts which we now skim from the surface will sharpen curiosity for the complete account while some were making an exploration of this beautiful lake the writer with a small party made a trip over the high divide between the waters of the yellowstone and missouri rivers into the firehole basin we had already encountered many of the difficulties attendant upon travelling in this rocky and densely wooded region but we were not prepared for the impediments which seemed to block our pathway everywhere we were without a guide and endeavoured to make our courses with a compass the autumnal fires sweep through the dry pines at times so that many square miles are covered with dead trees these are soon blown down by the winds and their long bodies are lodged upon each other in every possible direction sometimes these fallen pines are piled up in a sort of irregular network for six or eight feet in height presenting insurmountable obstacles in the way of the traveller then again the small pines grow so thickly that it seems almost impossible to find an interval between so wide as to admit a pack animal with his load the traveller may thus wind about among the fallen pines or the dense growth of living trees for an entire day and yet at night find that he has not made a distance of more than five or six miles in a straight line after encountering many obstructions we arrived at the firehole basin and spent five days in exploring its wonders making charts sketches photographs and taking the temperatures of the springs the boiling point of water at this elevation is about a hundred and ninety two to a hundred and ninety six degrees we ascertained the temperatures of more than six hundred hot springs in this valley and there were as many more that were dying out to which we did not think it worth while to give our attention many also must have been overlooked by us so that within an area of about five miles square we may estimate the existence of about twelve hundred to fifteen hundred springs with basins of all sizes from a few inches in diameter to three hundred feet the springs in this valley are of three kinds but varying much in their active power first those in which the ebullition occurs only at intervals and which may therefore be called intermittent springs second such as are constantly boiling and bubbling up therefore permanent springs third those whose surface is always undisturbed and in which there is no bubbling or boiling up the first class reach the boiling point only when in operation when in a state of repose the temperature of the water is as low as a hundred and fifty degrees the second class have a temperature equal to boiling water or not far below it in this region varying from a hundred and eighty to a hundred and ninety six degrees some of the largest of the springs are in a constant state of agitation one of the largest in the firehole basin is represented in the accompanying sketch the basin is about two hundred feet in diameter and the sides of the crater which have been much broken down are about thirty feet deep the crater is so filled with dense steam that it is only at periodical times that it is cleared away so that one can catch a glimpse of the seething cauldron below 
from one side of it five streams of water are ever flowing which in the aggregate form a river ten feet wide and two feet deep the delicate shades of colouring from the iron and sulphur are most finely displayed upon the surface over which this water flows but perhaps the most striking exhibition of nature's forces in this wonderful region is that of the grand geyser which is well shown in the accompanying illustration while we were in the firehole valley this geyser played only at intervals of about thirty-two hours but when it was in active operation the display was grand beyond description as we stood near the crater or basin it threw up with scarcely any preliminary warning a column of hot water eight feet in diameter to the height of two hundred feet and so steady and uniform did the force act that the column of water appeared to be held there for some minutes returning into the basin in millions of prismatic drops this was continued for about fifteen minutes and the rumbling and confusion attending it could only be compared to that of a charge in battle the steam poured out in immense masses rising in clouds a thousand feet or more in height after the grand geyser had ceased playing the water of the basin retired from the surface and the temperature fell gradually to a hundred and fifty degrees another geyser in the same group and named by the langford party old faithful was far more accommodating and played at intervals of only an hour throwing up a column of water at least six feet in diameter and one hundred and fifty feet high for a period of about fifteen minutes the ease with which this column of water was sustained at the great height during the period of its operation rendered it a marvel of beauty as well as of power we may say in conclusion that we have been able in this article to do little more than to allude to a few of the wonderful physical phenomena of this marvellous valley we pass with rapid transition from one remarkable vision to another each unique of its kind and surpassing all others in the known world the intelligent american will one day point on the map to this remarkable district with the conscious pride that it has not its parallel on the face of the globe why will not congress at once pass a law setting it apart as a great public park for all time to come as has been done with that not more remarkable wonder the yosemite valley End of part five. Part six of Yellowstone National Park Six Early Pieces by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part six Yellowstone National Park. Part one on certain portions of our globe almighty god has set a special imprint of divinity the alps the pyrenees the mexican volcanoes the solemn grandeur of norwegian fjords the sacred mountain of japan and the sublimity of india's himalayas at different epochs in a life of travel have filled my soul with awe and admiration but since the summer of eighteen ninety six there has been ranked with these in my remembrance the country of the yellowstone two-thirds across this continent hidden away in the heart of the rocky mountains eight thousand feet above the level of the sea there lies a marvellous section of our earth about one-half as large as the state of connecticut on three sides this is guarded by lofty well-nigh inaccessible mountains as though the infinite himself would not allow mankind to rashly enter its sublime enclosure in this respect our government has wisely imitated the creator it has proclaimed to all the world the sanctity of this peculiar area it has received it as a gift from god and as his trustee holds it for the welfare of humanity we then as citizens of the united states are its possessors and its guardians it is our national park yet although easy of access most of us let the years go by without exploring it how little we realize what a treasure we possess is proven by the fact that until recently the majority of tourists here were foreigners i thought my previous store of memories was rich but to have added to it the recollection of the yellowstone will give a greater happiness to life while life shall last day after day yes hour after hour within the girdle of its snow-capped peaks 
i looked upon a constant series of stupendous sights a blending of the beautiful and terrible the strange and the sublime which were moreover so peculiar that they stand out distinct and different from those of every other portion of our earth to call our national park the switzerland of america would be absurd it is not switzerland it is not iceland it is not norway it is unique and the unique cannot be compared if i were asked to describe it in a dozen lines i should call it the arena of an enormous amphitheatre its architect was nature the gladiators that contended in it were volcanoes during unnumbered ages those gladiators struggled to surpass one another in destruction by pouring forth great floods of molten lava even now the force which animated them still shows itself in other forms but harmlessly much as a captive serpent hisses though its fangs are drawn but the volcanoes give no sign of life they are dead actors in a fearful tragedy performed here countless centuries before the advent of mankind with this entire region for a stage and for their only audience the sun and stars i shall never forget our entrance into this theatre of sublime phenomena the pullman car in which we had taken our places at st paul had carried us in safety more than a thousand miles and had left us at the gateway of the park before us was a portion of the road eight miles in length which leads the tourist to the mammoth springs hotel on one side an impetuous river shouted a welcome as we rode along above us rose grey desolate cliffs they are volcanic in their origin the brand of fire is on them all they are symbolic therefore of the entire park for fire and water are the two great forces here which have for ages struggled for supremacy no human being dwells upon those dreary crags but at one point as i looked up at them i saw poised statue-like above a mighty pinnacle of rock a solitary eagle pausing with outstretched wings above its nest it seemed to look disdainfully upon us human pygmies crawling far below living at such a height in voluntary isolation that king of birds appeared the very embodiment of strength and majesty call it a touch of superstition if you will yet i confess it thrilled me to the heart to find that here above the very entrance to the wonderland of our republic there should be stationed midway between earth and heaven like a watchful sentinel our national bird the bird of freedom at length a sudden turn revealed to us our first halting-place within the park the mammoth springs hotel the structure in itself looked mammoth as we approached it for its portico exceeds four hundred feet in length our first impressions were agreeable porters rushed forth and helped us to alight and on the broad piazza the manager received us cordially everything had the air of an established summer resort this i confess surprised me greatly as i had expected primitive accommodations and supposed that though the days of camping out had largely passed away the resting places in the park were still so crude that one would be glad to leave them but i lingered here with pleasure long after all the wonders of the park had been beheld the furniture though simple is sufficient to satisfy our national nervousness the halls are so well stocked with rocking-chairs that european visitors look upon them with alarm and try to find some seats that promise a more stable equilibrium the sleeping-rooms are scrupulously clean soft blankets snow-white sheets and comfortable beds assure a good night's rest and the staff of coloured waiters in the dining-room steam-heat a bell-boy service and electric lights made us forget our distance from great cities and the haunts of men moreover what is true of this is true as well of the other hotels within the park and when i add that well-cooked food is served in all of them it will be seen that tourists need not fear a lengthy sojourn in these hostelries standing on the veranda of the mammoth hot springs hotel i saw between me and the range of mountains opposite a broad plateau on which were grouped a dozen neat and tasteful structures with the exception of the photographer's house in the foreground these constitute fort yellowstone 
a fort the visitor exclaims impossible these buildings are of wood not stone where are its turrets battlements and guns nevertheless this is a station for two companies of united states cavalry most of the houses being residences for the officers while in the rear are barracks for the soldiers no one who has visited the national park ever doubts the necessity of having soldiers there thus one of the most important duties of the united states troops stationed within its area is to save its splendid forests from destruction to do this calls for constant vigilance a fire started in the resinous pines which cover many of the mountain sides leaps forward with such fury that it would overtake a horseman fleeing for his life to guard against so serious a calamity soldiers patrol the park continually to see that all the campfires have been extinguished thanks to their watchful care only one notable conflagration has occurred here in the last eight years and that the soldiers fought with energy for twenty days till the last vestige of it was subdued the tourist comprehends the great importance of this work when he beholds the rivers of the park threading like avenues of silver the sombre framework of the trees and recollects that just such forests as adjoin these streams cover no less than eighty four per cent of its entire area in a treeless country like wyoming these forests are of priceless value because of their utility in holding back in spring the melting snow some of the largest rivers of our continent are fed from the well-timbered area of the yellowstone and if the trees were destroyed the enormous snowfall in the park unsheltered from the sun would melt so rapidly that the swollen torrents would quickly wash away roads bridges and productive farms even far out in the adjacent country and subsequently cause a serious drought for many months another very important labor of the united states soldiers here is to preserve the game within the park it is the purpose of our government to make this area a place of refuge for those animals which man's insatiate greed has now almost destroyed the remoteness of this lofty region together with its mountain fastnesses deep forests and sequestered glens make it an almost perfect game preserve there are at present thirty thousand elk within the park its deer and antelopes are steadily increasing and bears foxes and small game roam unmolested here buffaloes however are still few in number they have become too valuable a buffalo head which formerly could be bought for a mere trifle commands to-day a price of five hundred dollars hence daring poachers sometimes run the risk of entering the park in winter and destroying them it is sad to reflect how the buffaloes of this continent have been almost exterminated as late as thirty years ago trains often had to halt upon the prairies and even steamboats were occasionally obliged to wait an hour or two in the missouri river until enormous herds of buffalo had crossed their path now only about two hundred of these animals are in existence the sole survivors of the millions that once thundered over the western plains and disputed with the indians the ownership of this great continent until very recently travellers on our prairies frequently beheld the melancholy sight of labourers gathering up the buffalo bones which lay upon the plains like wreckage floating on the sea hundreds of carloads of these skeletons were shipped to factories in the east now to protect the few remaining buffaloes as well as other animals our troops patrol the park even in winter the principal stations are connected by telephone and information given thus is promptly acted on no traveller is allowed to carry firearms and any one who attempts to destroy animal life is liable to a fine of one thousand dollars or imprisonment for two years or both still another task devolving upon the military governor of the park is the building and repairing of its roads no doubt the superintendent is doing all he can with the amount of money that the government allows him but there is room for great improvement in these thoroughfares if congress will but make a suitable appropriation for the purpose at present a part of the coaching route is of necessity travelled over twice this should be obviated by constructing one more road by which the tourist could be brought to several interesting features of the park that are now rarely seen 
every one knows how roads in europe climb the steepest grade in easy curves and are usually as smooth as a marble table free from obstacles and carefully walled in by parapets of stone why should not we possess such roads especially in our national park dust is at present a great drawback to the traveller's pleasure here but this could be prevented if the roads were thoroughly macadamized surely the honour of our government demands that this unique museum of marvels should be the pride and glory of the nation with highways equal to any in the world only a few hundred feet distant from the mammoth springs hotel stands a strange naturally moulded shaft of stone fifty-two feet in height from certain points its summit calls to mind the headdress of the revolution and hence its name is liberty cap it is a fitting monument to mark the entrance into wonderland for it is the cone of an old geyser long since dead within it is a tube of unknown depth through that ages since was hurled at intervals a stream of boiling water precisely as it comes from active geysers in the park to-day but now the hand of time has stilled its passionate pulsations and laid upon its stony lips the seal of silence at only a little distance from this eloquent reminder of the past i peered into a cavern hundreds of feet deep it was once the reservoir of a geyser an atmosphere of sulphur haunts it still no doubt this whole plateau is but the cover of extinguished fires for other similar caves pierce the locality on which the hotel stands a feeling of solemnity stole over me as i surveyed these dead or dying agents of volcanic power in the great battle of the elements which has been going on here for unnumbered centuries they doubtless took an active part but time has given them a mortal wound and now they are waiting patiently until their younger comrades farther up the park shall one by one like them grow cold and motionless not more than fifty feet from liberty cap rise the famous hot spring terraces they constitute a veritable mountain covering at least two hundred acres the whole of which has been for centuries growing slowly through the agency of hot water issuing from the boiling springs this as it cools leaves a mineral deposit spread out in delicate thin layers by the soft ripples of the heated flood strange is it not everywhere else the flow of water wears away the substance that it touches but here by its peculiar sediment it builds as surely as the coral insect moreover the colouring of these terraces is if possible even more marvellous than their creation for as the mineral water pulsates over them it forms a great variety of brilliant hues hot water therefore is to this material what blood is to the body with it the features glow with warmth and colour without it they are cold and ghost-like accordingly where water ripples over these gigantic steps towering one above another toward the sky they look like beautiful cascades of colour and when the liquid has deserted them they stand out like a staircase of carrara marble hence through the changing centuries they pass in slow succession from light to shade from brilliancy to pallor and from life to death this mineral water is not only a mysterious architect it is also an artist that no man can equal its magic touch has intermingled the finest shades of orange yellow purple red and brown sometimes in solid masses at other places diversified by slender threads like skeins of multicoloured silk yet in producing all these wonderful effects there is no violence no uproar the boiling water passes over the mounds it has produced with the low murmur of a sweet cascade its tiny wavelets touch the stonework like a sculptor's fingers moulding the yielding mass into exquisitely graceful forms the top of each of these coloured steps is a pool of boiling water each of these tiny lakes is radiant with lovely hues and is bordered by a coloured coping resembling a curb of jasper or of porphyry yet the thinnest knife-blade can be placed here on the dividing line between vitality and death the contrast is as sudden and complete as that between the desert and the valley of the nile 
where egypt's river ends its overflow the desert sands begin and on these terraces it is the same where the life-giving water fails the golden colours become ashen this terraced mountain therefore seemed to me like a colossal checkerboard upon whose coloured squares the two great forces life and death were playing their eternal game there is a pathos in this evanescent beauty what lies about us in one place so grey and ghostly was once as bright and beautiful as that which we perceive a hundred feet away but nothing here retains supremacy the glory of this century will be the gravestone of the next around our feet are sepulchres of vanished splendour it seems as if the architect were constantly dissatisfied no sooner has he finished one magnificent structure than he impatiently begins another leaving the first to crumble and decay each new production seems to him the finest but never reaching his ideal he speedily abandons it to perish from neglect it cannot be said of these terraces that distance lends enchantment to the view the nearer you come to them the more beautiful they appear they even bear the inspection of a magnifying glass for they are covered with a bead-like ornamentation worthy of the goldsmith's art in one place for example rise pulpits finer than those of pisa or siena their edges seem to be of purest jasper they are upheld by tapering shafts resembling richly decorated organ pipes from parapets of porphyry hang gold stalactites side by side with icicles of silver moreover all its marvellous fretwork is distinctly visible for the light film of water pulsates over it so delicately that it can no more hide the filigree beneath than a thin veil conceals a face it is a melancholy fact that were it not for united states troops these beautiful objects would be mutilated by relic hunters hence another duty of our soldiers is to watch the formations constantly lest tourists should break off specimens and ruin them for ever and lest still more ignoble vandals whose fingers itch for notoriety should write upon these glorious works of nature their worthless names and those of the towns unfortunate enough to have produced them all possible measures are taken to prevent this vandalism thus every tourist entering the park must register his name most travellers do so as a matter of course at the hotels but even the arrivals of those who come here to camp must be duly recorded at the superintendent's office if a soldier sees a name or even initials written on the stone he telephones the fact to the military governor at once the lists are scanned for such a name if found the superintendent wires an order to have the man arrested and so careful is the search for all defacers that the offending party is usually found before he leaves the park then the superintendent like the mikado makes the punishment fit the crime a scrubbing brush and laundry soap are given to the desecrator and he is made to go back perhaps forty miles or more and with his own hands wash away the proofs of his disgraceful vanity not long ago a young man was arrested at six o'clock in the morning made to leave his bed and march without his breakfast several miles to prove that he could be as skilful with a brush as with a pencil after spending several days at the mammoth hot springs we started out to explore the greater marvels that awaited us in the interior the mode of travel through the park is a succession of coaching parties over a distance of one hundred and eighty miles the larger vehicles are drawn by six the smaller ones by four strong horses well fed well groomed high spirited yet safe this feature of our national park astonished me i had formed no idea of its perfection or its magnitude here for example are vehicles enough to accommodate seven hundred tourists for a continuous journey of five days here too are five hundred horses all of which can be harnessed at twenty-four hours notice and since the park is so remote here also are the company's blacksmith and repair shops within the stables also are the beautifully varnished coaches varying in cost from one to two thousand dollars and made in concord new hampshire twenty-five hundred miles away 
on one of these i read the number thirteen and a half why did you add the fraction i inquired of the manager of transportation because he replied some travellers would not take a number thirteen coach they feared a breakdown or a tumble into the river so i put on the half to take ill luck away i dwell at length upon these practical details because i have found that people in general do not know them most americans have little idea whether the driving distance in the park is ten miles or a hundred especially are they ignorant of the fact that they may leave the coaches at any point remain at a hotel as long as they desire and then resume their journey in other vehicles without the least additional expense for transportation precisely as one uses a stopover ticket on a railroad the fact that it is possible to go through the park in four or five days is not a reason why it is best to do so hundreds of tourists make the trip three times as rapidly as they would were they aware that they could remain comfortably for months when this is better known people will travel here more leisurely even now parents with little children sometimes leave them at the mammoth springs hotel in charge of nurses and receive messages by telephone every day to inform them how they are an important consideration also for invalids is the fact that two skilled surgeons attendant on the army are always easily accessible moreover the climate of the park in summer is delightful it is true the sun beats down at noonday fiercely the thin air offering scant resistance to its rays but in the shade one feels no heat at all light overcoats are needed when the sun goes down there is scarcely a night here through the year which passes without frost to me the pure dry air of that great height was more invigorating than any i had ever breathed save possibly that of norway and it is probably the tonic of the atmosphere that renders even the invalid and aged able to support long journeys in the park without exhaustion in all these years no tourist has been made ill here by fatigue a few miles after leaving the hot springs we reach the entrance to a picturesque ravine the tawny colour of whose rocks has given it the name of golden gate this is alike the entrance to and exit from the inner sanctuary of this land of marvels accordingly a solitary boulder detached from its companions on the cliff seems to be stationed at this portal like a sentinel to watch all tourists who come and go at all events it echoes to the voices of those who enter almost as eager as seekers after gold and a week later sees them return browned by the sun invigorated by the air and joyful in the acquisition of incomparable memories emerging from this golden gate i looked about me with surprise as the narrow walls of the ravine gave place to a plateau surrounded everywhere by snow-capped mountains from which the indians believed one could obtain a view of paradise across this area like a railroad traversing a prairie stretched the driveway for our carriages do tourists usually seem delighted with the park i asked our driver invariably he replied of course i cannot understand the words of the foreigners but their excited exclamations show their great enthusiasm i like the tourists he continued they are so grateful for any little favour one of them said to me the other day is the water here good to drink not always i replied you must be careful at once he pressed my hand pulled out a flask and said thank you while crossing the plateau we enjoyed an admirable view of the loftiest of the mountains which form around the park a rampart of protection its sharply pointed summit pierces the transparent air more than eleven thousand feet above the sea and it is well named electric peak since it appears to be a storage battery for all of the rocky mountains such are the mineral deposits on its sides that the best instruments of engineers are thrown into confusion and rendered useless while the lightning on this favourite home of electricity is said to be unparalleled presently a turn in the road revealed to us a dark-hued mountain rising almost perpendicularly from a lake marvellous to relate the material of which this mountain is composed is jet-black glass produced by volcanic fires the very road on which we drove between this and the lake also consists of glass too hard to break beneath the wheels the first explorers found this obsidian cliff 
almost impassable but when they ascertained of what it was composed they piled up timber at its base and set it on fire when the glass was hot they dashed upon the heated mass cold water which broke it into fragments then with huge levers picks and shovels they pushed and pried the shining pieces down into the lake and opened thus a wagon road a thousand feet in length the region of the yellowstone was to most indian tribes a place of horror they trembled at the awful sights they here beheld but the obsidian cliff was precious to them all its substance was as hard as flint and hence well suited for their arrowheads this mountain of volcanic glass was therefore the great indian armory and as such it was neutral ground hither all hostile tribes might come for implements of war and then depart unharmed while they were here a sacred intertribal oath protected them an hour later those very warriors might meet in deadly combat and turn against each other's breasts the weapons taken from that laboratory of an unknown power can we wonder that in former times when all this region was still unexplored and its majestic streams rolled nameless through a trackless wilderness the statements of the few brave men who ventured into this enclosure were disbelieved by all who heard them one old trapper became so angry when his stories of the place were doubted that he deliberately revenged himself by inventing tales of which munchausen would have been proud thus he declared that one day when he was hunting here he saw a bear he fired at it but without result the animal did not even notice him he fired again yet the big bear kept on grazing the hunter in astonishment then ran forward but suddenly dashed against a solid mountain made of glass through that he said he had been looking at the animal unspeakably amazed he finally walked around the mountain and was just taking aim again when he discovered that the glass had acted like a telescope and that the bear was twenty-five miles away not far from the volcanic cliff which gave the trapper inspiration for his story we reached one of the most famous basins of the park in briefest terms these basins are the spots in the arena where the crust is thinnest they are the trap-doors in a volcanic stage through which the fiery actors in the tragedy of nature which is here enacted come upon the scene literally they are the vents through which the steam and boiling water can escape in doing so however the water as at the mammoth springs leaves a sediment of pure white lime or silica hence from a distance these basins look like desolate expanses of white sand beside them always flows a river which carries off the boiling water to the outer world no illustration can do justice to what is called the norris basin but it is horrible enough to test the strongest nerves having full confidence in our guide the park photographer we ventured with him outside the usual track of tourists and went where all the money of the rothschilds would not have tempted us to go alone the crust beneath our feet was hot and often quivered as we walked a single misstep to the right or left would have been followed by appalling consequences thus a careless soldier only a few days before had broken through and was then lying in the hospital with both legs badly scalded around us were a hundred vats of water boiling furiously the air was heavy with the fumes of sulphur and the whole expanse was seamed with cracks and honeycombed with holes from which a noxious vapour crept out to pollute the air i thought of dante's walk through hell and called to mind the burning lake which he describes from which the wretched sufferers vainly sought to free themselves leaving at last this roof of the infernal regions just as we again stood apparently on solid ground a fierce explosion close beside us caused us to start and run for twenty feet our guide laughed heartily come back he said don't be afraid it is only a baby geyser five years old in fact in eighteen ninety one a sudden outburst of volcanic fury made an opening here through which at intervals of thirty minutes day and night hot water now leaps forth in wild confusion this then is a geyser i exclaimed bah said the guide contemptuously if you had seen the real geysers in the upper basin you would not look at this 
meantime for half an hour we had been hearing more and more distinctly a dull persistent roar like the escape of steam from a transatlantic liner at last we reached the cause it is a mass of steam which rushes from an opening in the ground summer and winter year by year in one unbroken volume the rock around it is as black as jet hence it is called the black growler think of the awful power confined beneath the surface here when this one angry voice can be distinctly heard four miles away choke up that aperture and what a terrible convulsion would ensue as the accumulated steam burst its prison walls it is a sight which makes one long to lift the cover from this monstrous cauldron learn the cause of its stupendous heat and trace the complicated and mysterious aqueducts through which the steam and water make their way returning from the black growler we halted at a lunch station the manager of which is larry all visitors to the park remember larry he has a different welcome for each guest good day professor come in my lord the top of the morning to you doctor these phrases flow as lightly from his tongue as water from a geyser his station is a mere tent but he will say with most amusing seriousness gentlemen walk one flight up and turn to the right ladies come this way and take the elevator now then luncheon is ready each guest take one seat and as much food as he can get where did you come from larry i asked from brooklyn sir was his reply but i'll never go back there for all my friends have been killed by the trolley cars larry is very democratic the other day a guest on sitting down to lunch took too much room upon the bench please move along sir said larry the stranger glared at him i am a count he remarked at last well sir said larry here you only count one hush exclaimed a member of the gentleman's suite that is count Shololoff. i'll forgive him that said larry if he won't shuffle off his seat pointing to my companion larry asked me what is that gentleman's business he is a teacher of singing i answered faith said larry i'd like to have him try my voice there's something very strange about my vocal cords whenever i sing the black growler stops one tourist told me it was a case of professional jealousy and said the black growler was envious of my forte tones i have not forty tones i said i've only one tone well says he make a note of it only once in his life has larry been put to silence two years ago a gentleman remarked to him well larry good-bye come and visit me next winter in the east in my house you shall have a nice room and if you are ill still enjoy a doctor's services free of all expense thank you said larry please give me your card the tourist handed it to him and larry with astonishment and horror read beneath the gentleman's name these words superintendent of the insane asylum utica new york some hours after leaving larry's lunch station we reached another area of volcanic action our nerves were steadier now the close proximity to hades was less evident yet here hot mineral water had spread broadcast innumerable little mounds of silica which look so much like biscuits grouped in a colossal pan that this is called the biscuit basin but they are not the kind that mother used to make if a tourist asked for bread here he would receive a stone since all these so-called biscuits are as hard as flint we walked upon their crusts with perfect safety yet in so doing our boots grew warm beneath our feet for the water in this miniature archipelago is heated to the boiling point show me a geyser i at last exclaimed impatiently i want to see a genuine geyser accordingly our guide conducted us to what he announced as the fountain i looked around me with surprise i saw no fountain but merely a pool of boiling water from which the light breeze bore away a thin transparent cloud of steam it is true around this was a pavement as delicately fashioned as any piece of coral ever taken from the sea nevertheless while i admired that i could not understand why this comparatively tranquil pool was called a geyser and frankly said i was disappointed but even as i spoke i saw to my astonishment the boiling water in this reservoir sink and disappear from view where has it gone i inquired eagerly stand back shouted the guide she's coming 
i ran back a few steps then turned and caught my breath for at that very instant up from the pool which i had just beheld so beautiful and tranquil there rose in one great outburst of sublimity such a stupendous mass of water as i had never imagined possible in a vertical form i knew that it was boiling and that a deluge of those scalding drops would probably mean death but i was powerless to move amazement and delight enchained me spellbound talk of a fountain this was a cloudburst of the rarest jewels which till that moment had been held in solution in a subterranean cavern but which had suddenly crystallized into a million radiant forms on thus emerging into light and air the sun was shining through the glittering mass and myriads of diamonds moonstones pearls and opals mingled in splendid rivalry two hundred feet above our heads End of part six. Part seven of Yellowstone National Park Six Early Pieces by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part seven Yellowstone National Park. Part two we soon approached another of the many geysers in the basin they are all different around one a number of colored blocks exquisitely decorated by the geysers waves appeared to have been placed artistically in an oblong frame when i first beheld them they looked like huge sea monsters which startled by our footsteps were about to plunge into the depths what is there in the natural world so fascinating and mysterious as a geyser what for example is the depth of its intensely colored pool of boiling water no one can tell one thing however is certain the surface of the pool is but the summit of a liquid column its base is in a subterranean reservoir into that reservoir there flows a volume of cold water furnished by the rain or snow or by infiltration from some lake or river meantime the walls of the deep reservoir are heated by volcanic fire accordingly the water in contact with these walls soon begins to boil and a great mass of steam collects above it there must of course be some escape for this and finally it makes its exit hurling the boiling water to a height of one or two hundred feet according to the force of the explosion imagine then the amount of water that even one such reservoir contains for some of these volcanic fountains play for more than half an hour before their contents are discharged think also that in this basin there are no less than thirty geysers seventeen of which have been observed in action simultaneously thus far we have seen merely geysers which arise from pools but presently we approached one which in the course of ages has built up for itself a cone or funnel for its scalding waves that said our guide is the castle geyser it looks like an old ruin without a single indication of activity save possibly the little cloud of steam that hangs above it as if it were the breath of some mysterious monster sleeping far below if you doubt it he replied go nearer and examine it we did so i scrambled up its flinty sides and found an opening in the summit three feet wide i touched the rock it was still warm and yet no water was discernible no sound was audible within its depths if this be really a geyser i remarked it is no doubt a lifeless one like liberty cap my comrade smiled looked at his watch then at his notebook and finally replied wait half an hour and see accordingly we lingered on the massive ledges of the castle geyser and learned that it is the largest probably the oldest of all the active geyser cones within the park once its eruptions were no doubt stupendous but now its power is waning the gradual closing up of its huge throat and the increasing substitution of steam for water prove that the monster has now entered on the final stage of its career for here as on the terraces we are surrounded by specimens of life decay and death the young the middle-aged the old the dead they are all here the fiery agitation of the pool and the impulsive spurts of water are indicative of youth a steady splendid outburst proves maturity 
the feebler action of the castle shows the waning powers of old age last of all comes the closed cone like a sealed sarcophagus and that is death meantime the thirty minutes of expectancy had passed and suddenly with a tremendous rush of steam the castle proved that its resources were by no means exhausted at the same instant half a mile away the beehive geyser threw into the air a shaft of dazzling spray fully two hundred feet in height i realized then as never before the noble action of our government in giving this incomparable region to the people if this had not been done the selfishness and greed of man would have made a tour here almost unbearable a fence would doubtless have been built around every geyser and fees would have been charged to witness each wonderful phenomenon whereas to-day thanks to the generosity of congress the park itself and everything that it contains are absolutely free to all rich and poor native and foreigner forever consecrated to the education and delight of man but no enumeration of the geysers would be complete without a mention of the special favorite of tourists old faithful the opening through which this miracle of nature springs is at the summit of a beautifully ornamented mound which is itself a page in nature's wonder book the lines upon its wrinkled face tell of a past whose secrets still remain a mystery it hints of an antiquity so vast that one contemplates it with bated breath for this entire slope has been built up atom after atom through unnumbered ages during which time no doubt the geyser hour by hour has faithfully performed its part without an eye to note its splendour or a voice to tell its glory to the world old faithful does not owe its popularity entirely to height or beauty though it possesses both it is beloved for its fidelity whatever irregularities other geysers show old faithful never fails year in year out winter and summer day and night in cold and heat in sunshine and in storm old faithful every seventy minutes sends up its silvery cascade to the height of about one hundred and eighty feet of all the geysers known to man this is the most reliable and perfect station yourself before it watch in hand and punctual to the moment it will never disappoint you few realize on how large a scale the forces of nature work here at each eruption old faithful pours forth about one million five hundred thousand gallons or more than thirty three million gallons in one day this geyser alone therefore could easily supply with water a city the size of boston within this area of active geysers is a place called hell's half acre it is rightly named rough perpendicular ledges project over a monstrous gulf of unknown depth from which great clouds of steam are constantly emerging when the wind draws back for a moment a portion of this sulphur-laden curtain the visitor perceives a lake below seething and boiling from internal heat for years no one suspected this to be a geyser but suddenly in eighteen eighty one the underlying force hurled the entire lake up bodily to the height of two hundred and fifty feet and even repeated frequently after some months the exhibition ceased and all was calm again for seven years in eighteen eighty eight however it once more burst forth with prodigious energy ejecting at each explosion more boiling water than all the other geysers in the park combined even the surrounding ledges could not withstand this terrible upheaval and tons of rock were sometimes thrown up with the water more than two hundred feet it is not strange therefore that this is called excelsior the king of geysers it is the most tremendous awe-inspiring fountain in the world when it will be again aroused no one can tell its interval would seem to be from seven to ten years said an enthusiastic traveller to me if the excelsior ever plays again i will gladly travel three thousand miles to see it i have a vivid remembrance of my last night at the upper basin the hush of evening hallowed it alone and undisturbed we looked upon a scene unequalled in the world around us liquid columns rose and fell with ceaseless regularity the cooler air of evening made many shafts of vapour visible which in the glare of day had vanished unperceived 
so perfect were their images in the adjoining stream that it was easy to believe the veil had been at last withdrawn and that the hidden source of all this wonderful display had been revealed no sound from them was audible no breeze disturbed their steadfast flight toward heaven and in the deepening twilight the slender white-robed column seems like the ghost of geysers long since dead revisiting the scene of their activity but geysers do not constitute the only marvels of these volcanic basins the beauty of their pools of boiling water is almost inconceivable to those who have not seen them no illustration can do them justice for no photographer can adequately reproduce their clear transparent depths nor can an artist's brush ever quite portray their peculiar colouring due to the minerals held in solution or else deposited upon their sides i can deliberately say however that some of the most exquisitely beautiful objects i have ever seen in any portion of the world are the superbly tinted cauldrons of the yellowstone their hues are infinitely varied many are blue some green some golden and some wine-coloured in all gradations of tone and could we soar aloft and take of them a bird's-eye view the glittering basin might seem to us a silver shield studded with rubies emeralds turquoises and sapphires moreover these miniature lakes are lined with exquisite ornamentation one sees in them with absolute distinctness a reproduction of the loveliest forms that he has ever found in floral or in vegetable life gardens of mushrooms banks of goldenrod or clusters of asparagus appear to be growing here created by the architect and coloured by the artist of these mineral springs the most renowned of all these reservoirs of colour is called the emerald pool painters from this and other lands have tried repeatedly to depict this faithfully upon canvas but finally have left it in despair in fact its colouring is so intense that as the bubbles rising to its surface lift from this bowl their rounded forms and pause a second in the air before they break they are still just as richly tinted as the flood beneath accordingly this pool appeared to me like a colossal casket filled with emeralds which spirit hands from time to time drew gently upward from its jewelled depths close by this is another boiling pool called the sunlight lake on this i saw one of the most marvellous phenomena i have ever looked upon the colours of this tiny sheet of water appeared not only in concentric circles like the rings of a tree but also in the order of the spectrum the outer band was crimson and then the unbroken sequence came red orange yellow green blue and violet in the centre moreover the very steam arising from it reflecting as it did the varied tints beneath was exquisitely coloured and vanished into air like a dissolving rainbow all these prismatic pools are clasped by beautifully decorated curbs of silica and seem to be set in rings of gold with mineral colours running through them like enamel so delicate are the touches of the magic water as the persistent heartbeats of old mother earth propel it over their ornamental rims that every ripple leaves its tiny mark hence it is no exaggeration but literal truth to say that beautiful mosaic work is being formed each time the films of boiling water are dimpled by the passing breeze the great variety of wonders in our national park was a continual source of pleasure and surprise to me thus in the midst of all the pools and geysers in the upper basin is one known as the mammoth paint pot the earth surrounding it is cracked and blistered by heat and from this rises a parapet five feet high enclosing a space resembling a circus ring within this area is a mixture of soft clay and boiling water suggesting an enormous cauldron of hot mush this bubbling slime is almost as diversely tinted as the pools themselves it seemed to me that i was looking into a huge vat where unseen painters were engaged in mixing colours the fact is easily explained the mineral ingredients of the volcanic soil produce these different hues in a new form it is the same old story of the mammoth terraces fire supplies the pigments and hot water uses them all other features of the park are solemn and impressive but the mammoth paint-pot provokes a smile 
there is no grandeur here it seems a burlesque on volcanic power the steam which oozes through the plastic mass tosses its substance into curious lilliputian shapes which rise and break like bubbles a mirthful demon seems to be engaged in moulding grotesque images in clay which turn a somersault and then fall back to vanish in the seething depths now it will be a flower then a face then possibly a mannequin resembling toys for children meanwhile one hears constantly a low accompaniment of groanings hiccups and expectorations as if the aforesaid demon found this pudding difficult to digest soon after leaving the upper geyser basin we approached a tiny lake which has in some respects no equal in the world with the exception of some isolated mountain peaks it marks the highest portion of our country in winter therefore when encircled by mounds of snow it rests upon the summit of our continent like a crown of sapphire set with pearls so evenly is it balanced that when it overflows one part of it descends to the atlantic another part to the pacific this little streamlet therefore is a silver thread connecting two great oceans three thousand miles apart accordingly one might easily fancy that every drop in this pure mountain reservoir possessed a separate individuality and that a passing breeze or falling leaf might decide its destiny propelling it with gentle force into a current which should lead it eastward to be silvered by the dawn or westward to be gilded by the setting sun on either side of this elevation known as the continental divide the view was glorious in one direction an ocean of dark pines rolled westward in enormous billows the silver surfaces of several lakes gleamed here and there like white caps on the rolling waves far off upon the verge of the horizon fifty miles away three snow-capped sharply pointed mountains looked like a group of icebergs drifting from the polar sea they did not move however nor will they move while this old earth shall last they antedate by ages the pyramids which they resemble they will be standing thus in majesty when egypt's royal sepulchres shall have returned to dust forever anchored there those three resplendent peaks rise fourteen thousand feet above the sea and form the grand tiara of our continent the loftiest summits of the rocky mountains as we began the descent from this great elevation another splendid vision greeted us we gazed upon it with delight beyond a vast expanse of dark green pines we saw three hundred feet below us lake yellowstone it stirred my heart to look at last upon this famous inland sea nearly eight thousand feet above the ocean level and to realize that if the white mountain monarch washington were planted in its depths its base line on a level with the sea there would remain two thousand feet of space between its summit and the surface of this lake in this respect it has but one real rival lake titicaca in the andes of peru descending to the shore however we found that even here so far from shipyards and the sea a steamboat was awaiting us imagine the labour of conveying such a vessel sixty-five miles from the railroad to this lake up an ascent of more than three thousand feet of course it was brought in several sections but even then in one or two mountain gorges the cliffs had to be blasted away to make room for it to pass it is needless to add that this steamer has no rivals it was with the greatest interest that i sailed at such a height on this adventurous craft and the next time that i stand upon the summit of mount washington and see the fleecy clouds float in the empyrean one-third of a mile above me i shall remember that the steamer on lake yellowstone sails at precisely the same altitude as that enjoyed by those sun-tinted galleons of the sky to appreciate the beauty of lake yellowstone one should behold it when its waves are radiant with the sunset glow it is however not only beautiful it is mysterious around it in the distance rise silver crested peaks whose melting snow descends to it in ice-cold streams still nearer we behold a girdle of gigantic forests rarely if ever trodden by the foot of man oh the loneliness of this great lake 
for eight long months scarcely a human eye beholds it the wintry storms that sweep its surface find no boats on which to vent their fury lake yellowstone has never mirrored in itself even the frail canoes of painted savages the only keels that ever furrow it are those of its solitary steamer and some little fishing boats engaged by tourists even these lead a very brief existence like summer insects they will float here a few weeks and disappear leaving the winds and waves to their will in sailing on this lake i observed a distant mountain whose summit bore a strange resemblance to an upturned human face sculptured in bold relief against the sky it is appropriately called the sleeping giant for it has slept on undisturbed while countless centuries have dropped into the gulf of time like leaves in the adjoining forest how many nights have cast their shadows like a veil upon that giant's silhouette how many dawns have flooded it with light and found those changeless features still confronting them we call it human in appearance and yet that profile was the same before the first man ever trod this planet grim awful model of the coming race did not its stern lips smile disdainfully at the first human pygmy fashioned in its likeness this lake has one peculiarity which in the minds of certain tourists eclipses all the rest i mean its possibilities for fishing we know that sad experience has taught mankind to invent the proverb once a fisherman always a liar i wish then at the start to say that i am no fisherman but what i saw here would inevitably make me one if i should remain a month or two upon these shores lake yellowstone is the fisherman's paradise said one of isaac walton's followers to me i would rather be an angler here than an angel nor is this strange i saw two men catch from this lake in one hour more than a hundred splendid trout weighing from one to three pounds apiece they worked with incredible rapidity scarcely did the fly touch the water when the line was drawn the light rod dipped with graceful curve and the revolving reel drew in the speckled beauty to the shore each of these anglers had two hooks upon his line and both of them once had two trout hooked at the same time and landed them while we poor eastern visitors at first looked on in dumb amazement and then enthusiastically cheered can the reader bear something still more trying to his faith emerging from the lake is a little cone containing a boiling pool entirely distinct from the surrounding water i saw a fisherman stand on this and catch a trout which without moving from his place or even unhooking the fish he dropped into the boiling pool and cooked when the first scientific explorers of this region were urging upon congress the necessity of making it a national park their statements in regard to fishing were usually received with courteous incredulity but when one of their number gravely declared that trout could there be caught and boiled in the same lake within a radius of fifteen feet the house of representatives broke forth into roars of laughter and thought the man a monumental liar we cannot be surprised therefore that enthusiastic fishermen almost go crazy here i have seen men after a ride of forty miles rush off to fish without a moment's rest as if their lives depended on it some years ago general wade hampton visited the park and came as far as lake yellowstone on his return some one inquired what he thought of nature's masterpiece the canyon of the yellowstone the canyon cried the general no matter about the canyon but i had the most magnificent fishing i ever saw in my life one day while walking along the shore my comrade suddenly pressed my arm and pointed toward the lake an indian i cried in great astonishment i thought no indians ever came here our guide laughed heartily and as he did so i perceived my error what i had thought to be an indian was but a portion of a tree which had been placed upright against a log the only artificial thing about it was a bunch of feathers everything else was absolutely natural no knife had sculptured it no hand had given a support to its uplifted arm even the dog which followed us appeared deceived for he barked furiously at the strange intruder 
there was to me a singular fascination in this solitary freak of nature and surrounded though i was by immeasurably greater wonders i turned again and again to take a farewell look at this dark slender figure raising its hand as if in threatening gesture to some unseen foe leaving the lake we presently entered the loveliest portion of the park a level sheltered area of some fifty square miles to which has been given the appropriate name of hayden valley in commemoration of the distinguished geologist dr ferdinand v hayden who did so much to explore this region and to impress upon the government the necessity of preserving its incomparable natural features even this tranquil portion of the park is undermined by just such fiery forces as are elsewhere visible but which here manifest themselves in different ways thus in the midst of this natural beauty is a horrible object known as the mud geyser we crawled up a steep bank and shudderingly gazed over it into the crater forty feet below us the earth yawned open like a cavernous mouth from which a long black throat some six feet in diameter extended to an unknown depth this throat was filled with boiling mud which rose and fell in nauseating gulps as if some monster were strangling from a slimy paste which all its efforts could not possibly dislodge occasionally the sickening mixture would sink from view as if the tortured wretch had swallowed it then we could hear hundreds of feet below unearthly retching and in a moment it would all come up again belched out with an explosive force that hurled a boiling spray of mud so high that we rushed down the slope a single drop of it would have burned like molten lead five minutes of this was enough and even now when i reflect that every moment day and night the same regurgitation of black slime is going on i feel as i have often felt when on a stormy night at sea i have tried to sit through a coarse dinner on an ocean steamer not far from this perpetually active object is one that has been motionless for ages a granite boulder enclosed by trees as by the bars of a gigantic cage it is a proof that glaciers once ploughed through this region and it was no doubt brought hither in the glacial period on a flood of ice which melting in this heated basin left its burden a grim reminder of how worlds are made think what a combination of terrific forces must have been at work here when the volcanoes were in full activity and when the mass of ice which then encased our northern world strove to enclose this prison-house of fire within its glacial arms one of our party remarked that the covering of this seething boiling area with ice must have been the nearest approach to hell's freezing over that our earth has ever seen another striking feature of our national park is its petrified forest where scattered over a large area are solitary columns which once were trunks of trees but now are solid shafts of agate the substance of the wood however is still apparent the bark the wormholes and even the rings of growth being distinctly visible but every fibre has been petrified by the mysterious substitution of a mineral deposit no doubt these trees were once submerged in a strong mineral solution tinted with every colour of the rainbow still more marvellous to relate an excavation on the hillside proves that there are eleven layers of such forests one above another divided by as many cushions of lava think of the ages represented here during which all these different forests grew and were successively turned to stone this therefore is another illustration of the conflict between life and death each was in turn a victor and rested on its laurels for unnumbered centuries life is triumphant now but who shall say that death may not again prove conqueror if not immediately death may well be patient he will rule all this planet in the end no one can travel through the yellowstone park without imagining how it looks in winter the snowfall is enormous some drifts in the ravines being hundreds of feet deep and owing to the increased supply of water the geysers throw higher streams no travelling is possible then except on snowshoes and it is with difficulty that some of the park hotels are reached as late as the middle of may 
of course in such a frigid atmosphere the steam arising from the geysers is almost instantly congealed and eyewitnesses affirm that in a temperature of forty degrees below zero the clouds of vapor sent up by old faithful rose fully two thousand feet and were seen ten miles away it can be well imagined that to do much exploration here in winter is not alone immensely difficult but dangerous in eighteen eighty seven an expedition was formed headed by lieutenant frederick schwatka but though he was experienced as an arctic traveller in three days he advanced only twenty miles and finally gave out completely most of the exploring party turned back with him but four kept heroically on one of whom was the photographer mr f j haynes of st paul undismayed by schwatzka's failure he and his comrades bravely persisted in their undertaking for thirty days the mercury never rose higher than ten degrees below zero once it marked fifty two degrees below yet these men were obliged to camp out every night and carry on their shoulders provisions sleeping-bags and photographic instruments but finally they triumphed over every obstacle having in midwinter made a tour of two hundred miles through the park nevertheless they almost lost their lives in the attempt at one point ten thousand feet above the sea a fearful blizzard overtook them the cold and wind seemed unendurable even for an hour but they endured them for three days a sharp sleet cut their faces like a rain of needles and made it perilous to look ahead almost dead from sheer exhaustion they were unable to lie down for fear of freezing chilled to the bone they could make no fire and although fainting they had not a mouthful for seventy-two hours what a terrific chapter for any man to add to the mysterious volume we call life one might suppose by this time that all the marvels of our national park had been described but on the contrary so far is it from being true that i have yet to mention the most stupendous of them all the world-renowned canyon of the yellowstone the introduction to this is sublime it is a waterfall the height of which is more than twice as great as that of niagara to understand the reason for the presence of such a cataract we should remember that the entire region for miles was once a geyser basin the river was then near the surface and has been cutting down the walls of the canyon ever since the volcanic soil decomposed by heat could not resist the constant action of the water only a granite bluff at the upper end of the canyon has held firm and over that the baffled stream now leaps to wreak its vengeance on the weaker foe beneath through a colossal gateway of vast height yet only seventy feet in breadth falls the entire volume of the yellowstone river it seems enraged at being suddenly compressed into that narrow space for with a roar of anger and defiance and without an instant's hesitation it leaps into the yawning gulf in one great flood of dazzling foam when looked upon from a little distance a clasp of emerald apparently surmounts it from which descends a spotless robe of ermine nearly four hundred feet in length the lower portion is concealed by clouds of mist which vainly try to climb the surrounding cliffs like ghosts of submerged mountains striving to escape from their eternal prison we ask ourselves instinctively what gives this river its tremendous impetus and causes it to fill the air with diamond-tinted spray and send up to the cliffs a ceaseless roar which echoes and re-echoes down the canyon how awe-inspiring seems the answer to this question when we think upon it seriously the subtle force which draws this torrent down is the same power which holds the planets in their courses retains the comets in their fearful paths and guides the movements of the stellar universe what is this power we call it gravitation but why does it invariably act thus with mathematical precision who knows behind all such phenomena there is a mystery that none can solve this cataract has a voice if we could understand it perhaps we could distinguish after all but one word god as for the gorge through which this river flows imagine if you can a yawning chasm ten miles long and fifteen hundred feet in depth peer into it and see if you can find the river 
yes there it lies one thousand five hundred feet below a winding path of emerald and alabaster dividing the huge canyon walls seen from the summit it hardly seems to move but in reality it rages like a captive lion springing at its bars scarcely a sound of its fierce fury reaches us yet could we stand beside it a quarter of a mile below its voice would drown our loudest shouts to one another attracted to this river innumerable little streams are trickling down the colored cliffs they are cascades of boiling water emerging from the awful reservoir of heat which underlies this laboratory of the infinite one of them is a geyser the liquid shaft of which is scarcely visible yet in reality is one hundred and fifty feet in height from all these hot additions to its waves the temperature of the river even a mile or two beyond the canyon is twenty degrees higher than at its entrance are there not other canyons in the world as large as this it may be asked yes but none like this for see instead of sullen granite walls these sides are radiant with color age after age and eon after eon hot water has been spreading over these miles of masonry its variegated sediment like pigments on an artist's palette here for example is an expanse of yellow one thousand feet in height mingled with this are areas of red resembling jasper beside these is a field of lavender five hundred feet in length and soft in hue as the down upon a pigeon's breast no shade is wanting here except the blue and god replaces that it is supplied by the overspreading canopy of heaven yet there is no monotony in these hues nature apparently has passed along this canyon touching the rocks capriciously now staining an entire cliff as red as blood now tinging a light pinnacle with green now spreading over the whole face of a mountain a vast persian rug hence both sides of the canyon present successive miles of oriental tapestry moreover every passing cloud works here almost a miracle for all the lights and shades that follow one another down this gorge vary its tints as if by magic and make of it one long kaleidoscope of changing color nor are these cliffs less wonderful in form than color the substance of their tinted rocks is delicate the rain has therefore ploughed their faces with a million furrows the wind has carved them like a sculptor's chisel the lightning's bolts have splintered them until mile after mile they rise in a bewildering variety of architectural forms old castles frown above the maddened stream a thousand times more grand than any ruins on the rhine their towers are five hundred feet in height turrets and battlements portcullises and drawbridges rise from the deep ravine sublime and inaccessible yet they are still a thousand feet below us what would be the effect could we survey them from the stream itself within the gloomy crevice of the canyon only their size convinces us that they are works of nature not of art upon their spires we see a score of eagles nests the splendid birds leave these at times and swoop down toward the stream not in one mighty plunge but gracefully in slow majestic curves lower and lower till we can follow them only through a field glass as they alight on trees which look to us like shrubs but many of these forms are grander than any castles in one place is an amphitheatre within its curving arms a hundred thousand people could be seated its foreground is the emerald river its drop curtain the radiant canyon wall cathedrals too are here with spires twice as high as those which soar above the minster of cologne fantastic gargoyles stretch out from the parapets a hundred flying buttresses connect them with the mountain side from any one of them as many shafts shoot heavenward as statues rise from the duomo of milan and each of these great canyon shrines instead of stained glass windows has walls roof dome and pinnacles one mass of variegated color the awful grandeur of these temples sculptured by the deity is overpowering we feel that we must worship here it is a place where the finite prays the infinite hears and immensity looks on 
two visions of this world stand out within my memory which though entirely different i can place side by side in equal rank they are the himalayas of india and the grand canyon of the yellowstone on neither of them is there any sign of human life no voice disturbs their solemn stillness the only sound upon earth's loftiest mountains is the thunder of the avalanche the only voice within this canyon is the roar of its magnificent cascade it is well that man must halt upon the borders of this awful chasm it is no place for man the infinite allows him to stand trembling on the brink look down and listen spellbound to the anthem of its mighty cataract but beyond this he may not cannot go it is as if almighty god had kept for his own use one part of his creation that man might merely gaze upon it worship and retire end of part seven part eight of yellowstone national park six early pieces by various this librivox recording is in the public domain part eight thirty seven days of peril part one i have read with great satisfaction the excellent descriptive articles on the wonders of the upper yellowstone in the may and june numbers of your magazine having myself been one of the party who participated in many of the pleasures and suffered all the perils of that expedition i can not only bear testimony to the fidelity of the narrative but probably add some facts of experience which will not detract from the general interest it has excited a desire to visit the remarkable region of which during several years residence in montana i had often heard the most marvellous accounts led me to unite in the expedition of august last the general character of the stupendous scenery of the rocky mountains prepared my mind for giving credit to all the strange stories told of the yellowstone and i felt quite as certain of the existence of the physical phenomena of that country on the morning that our company started from helena as when i afterwards beheld it i engaged in the enterprise with enthusiasm feeling that all the hardships and exposures of a month's horseback travel through an unexplored region would be more than compensated by the grandeur and novelty of the natural objects with which it was crowded of course the idea of being lost in it without any of the ordinary means of subsistence and the wandering for days and weeks in a famishing condition alone in an unfrequented wilderness formed no part of my contemplation i had dwelt too long amid the mountains not to know that such a thought had it occurred would have been instantly rejected as improbable nevertheless man proposes and god disposes a truism which found a new and ample illustration in my wanderings through the upper yellowstone region on the day that i found myself separated from the company and for several days previous our course had been impeded by the dense growth of the pine forest and occasional large tracts of fallen timber frequently rendering our progress almost impossible whenever we came to one of these immense windfalls each man engaged in the pursuit of a passage through it and it was while thus employed and with the idea that i had found one that i strayed out of sight and hearing of my comrades we had a toilsome day it was quite late in the afternoon as separation like this had frequently occurred it gave me no alarm and i rode on fully confident of soon rejoining the company or of finding their camp i came up with the pack-horse which mr langford afterwards recovered and tried to drive him along but failing to do so and my eyesight being defective i spurred forward intending to return with assistance from the party this incident tended to accelerate my speed i rode on in the direction which i supposed had been taken until darkness overtook me in the dense forest this was disagreeable enough but caused me no alarm i had no doubt of being with the party at breakfast the next morning i selected a spot for comfortable repose picketed my horse built a fire and went to sleep the next morning i rose at early dawn saddled and mounted my horse and took my course in the supposed direction of the camp 
our ride of the previous day had been up a peninsula jutting into the lake for the shore of which i started with the expectation of finding my friends camped on the beach the forest was quite dark and the trees so thick that it was only by a slow process i could get through them at all in searching for the trail i became somewhat confused the falling foliage of the pines had obliterated every trace of travel i was obliged frequently to dismount and examine the ground for the faintest indications coming to an opening from which i would see several vistas i dismounted for the purpose of selecting one leading in the direction i had chosen and leaving my horse unhitched as had always been my custom walked a few yards into the forest while surveying the ground my horse took fright and i turned around in time to see him disappearing at full speed among the trees that was the last i ever saw of him it was yet quite dark my blankets gun pistols fishing tackle matches everything except the clothing on my person a couple of knives and a small opera glass were attached to the saddle i did not realize the possibility of a permanent separation from the company instead of following up the pursuit of their camp i engaged in an effort to recover my horse half a day's search convinced me of its impracticability i wrote and posted in an open space several notices which if my friends should chance to see would inform them of my condition and the route i had taken and then struck out into the forest in the supposed direction of their camp as the day wore on without any discovery alarm took the place of anxiety at the prospect of another night alone in the wilderness and this time without food or fire but even this dismal foreboding was cheered by the hope that should soon rejoin my companions who would laugh at my adventure and incorporate it as a thrilling episode into the journal of our trip the bright side of a misfortune as i found by experience even under the worst possible circumstances always presents some features of encouragement when i began to realize that my condition was one of actual peril i banished from my mind all fear of an unfavorable result seating myself on a log i recalled every foot of the way i had traveled since the separation from my friends and the most probable opinion i could form of their whereabouts was that they had by a course but little different from mine passed by the spot where i had posted the notices learned of my disaster and were waiting for me the rejoin of them there or searching for me in that vicinity a night must be spent amid the prostrate trunks before my return could be accomplished at no time during my period of exile did i experience so much mental suffering from the cravings of hunger as when exhausted from this long day of fruitless search i resigned myself to a couch of pine foliage in the pitchy darkness of a thicket of small trees naturally timid in the night i fully realized the exposure of my condition i peered upward through the darkness but all was blackness and gloom the wind sighed mournfully through the pines the forest seemed alive with the screeching of night birds the angry barking of coyotes and the prolonged dismal howl of the gray wolf these sounds familiar by their constant occurrence throughout the journey were now full of terror and drove slumber from my eyelids above all this however was the hope that i should be restored to my comrades the next day early the next morning i rose unrefreshed and pursued my weary way over the prostrate trunks it was noon when i reached the spot where my notices were posted no one had been there my disappointment was almost overwhelming for the first time i realized that i was lost then came a crushing sense of destitution no food no fire no means to procure either alone in an unexplored wilderness one hundred and fifty miles from the nearest human abode surrounded by wild beasts and famishing with hunger it was no time for despondency a moment afterwards i felt how calamity can elevate the mind in the formation of the resolution not to perish in that wilderness the hope of finding the party still controlled my plans i thought by traversing the peninsula centrally i might be enabled to strike the shore of the lake in advance of their camp and near the point of departure for the madison acting upon this impression i rose from a sleepless couch and pursued my way through the timber-entangled forest 
a feeling of weakness took the place of hunger conscious of the need of food i felt no cravings occasionally while scrambling over logs and through thickets a sense of faintness and exhaustion would come over me but i would suppress it with the audible expression this won't do i must find my company despondency would sometimes strive with resolution for the mastery of my thoughts i would think of home of my daughter and of the possible chance of starvation or death in some more terrible form but as soon as these gloomy forebodings came i would strive to banish them with reflections better adapted to my immediate necessities i recollect at this time discussing the question whether there was not implanted by providence in every man a principle of self-preservation equal to any emergency which did not destroy his reason i decided this question affirmatively a thousand times afterwards in my wanderings and i record this experience here that any person who reads it should he ever find himself in like circumstances may not despair there is life in the thought it will revive hope allay hunger renew energy encourage perseverance and as i have proved in my own case bring a man out of difficulty when nothing else can avail it was midday when i emerged from the forest into an open space at the foot of the peninsula a broad lake of beautiful curvature with magnificent surroundings lay before me glittering in the sunbeams it was full twelve miles in circumference a wide belt of sand formed the margin which i was approaching directly opposite to which rising seemingly from the very depths of the water towered the loftiest peak of a range of mountains apparently interminable the ascending vapour from innumerable hot springs and the sparkling jet of a single geyser added the feature of novelty to one of the grandest landscapes i ever beheld nor was the life of the scene less noticeable than its other attractions large flocks of swans and other waterfowl were sporting on the quiet surface of the lake otters in great numbers performed the most amusing aquatic evolutions mink and beaver swam around unscared in the most grotesque confusion deer elk and mountain sheep stared at me manifesting more surprise than fear at my presence among them the adjacent forest was vocal with the songs of birds chief of which were the chattering notes of a species of mocking-bird whose imitative efforts afforded abundant merriment seen under favourable circumstances this assemblage of grandeur beauty and novelty would have been transporting but jaded with travel famishing with hunger and distressed with anxiety i was in no humour for ecstasy my tastes were subdued and chastened by the perils which environed me i longed for food friends and protection associated with my thoughts however was the wish that some of my friends of peculiar tastes could enjoy this display of secluded magnificence now probably for the first time beheld by mortal eyes the lake was at least one thousand feet lower than the highest point of the peninsula and several hundred feet below the level of yellowstone lake i recognized the mountain which overshadowed it as the landmark which a few days before had received from general washburn the name of mount everts and as it was associated with some of the most agreeable and terrible incidents of my exile i feel that i have more than a mere discoverer's right to the perpetuity of that christening the lake is fed by innumerable small streams from the mountains and the countless hot springs surrounding it a large river flows from it through a canyon a thousand feet in height in a southeasterly direction to a distant range of mountains which i conjectured to be snake river and with the belief that i had discovered the source of the great southern tributary of the columbia i gave it the name of bessie lake after the sole daughter of my house and heart during the first two days the fear of meeting with indians gave me considerable anxiety but when conscious of being lost there was nothing i so much desired as to fall in with a lodge of bannocks or crows having nothing to tempt their cupidity they would do me no personal harm and with the promise of reward would probably minister to my wants and aid my deliverance 
imagine my delight while gazing upon the animated expanse of water at seeing sail out from a distant point a large canoe containing a single oarsman it was rapidly approaching the shore where i was seated with hurried steps i paced the beach to meet it all my energy stimulated by the assurance it gave of food safety and restoration to friends as i drew near to it it turned towards the shore and oh bitter disappointment the object which my eager fancy had transformed into an angel of relief stalked from the water an enormous pelican flapped its dragon wings as if in mockery of my sorrow and flew to a solitary point farther up the lake this little incident quite unmanned me the transition from joy to grief brought with it a terrible consciousness of the horrors of my condition but night was fast approaching and darkness would come with it while looking for a spot where i might repose in safety my attention was attracted to a small green plant of so lively a hue as to form a striking contrast with deep pine foliage for closer examination i pulled it up by the root which was long and tapering not unlike a radish it was a thistle i tasted it it was palatable and nutritious my appetite craved it and the first meal in four days was made on thistle roots eureka i had found food no optical illusion deceived me this time i could subsist until i rejoined my companions glorious counterpoise to the wretchedness of the preceding half-hour overjoyed at this discovery with hunger allayed i stretched myself under a tree upon the foliage which had partially filled a space between contiguous trunks and fell asleep how long i slept i know not but suddenly i was roused by a loud shrill scream like that of a human being in distress poured seemingly into the very portals of my ear there was no mistaking that fearful voice i had been deceived by and answered it a dozen times while threading the forest with the belief that it was a friendly signal it was the screech of a mountain lion so alarmingly near as to cause every nerve to thrill with terror to yell in return seize with convulsive grasp the limbs of the friendly tree and swing myself into it was the work of a moment scrambling hurriedly from limb to limb i was soon as near the top as safety would permit the savage beast was snuffing and growling below apparently on the very spot i had just abandoned i answered every growl with a responsive scream terrified at the delay and pawing of the beast i increased my voice to its utmost volume broke branches from the limbs and in the impotency of fright madly hurled them at the spot whence the continued howlings proceeded failing to alarm the animal which now began to make a circuit of the tree as if to select a spot for springing into it i shook with a strength increased by terror the slender trunk until every limb rustled with the motion all in vain the terrible creature pursued his walk around the tree lashing the ground with his tail and prolonging his howlings almost to a roar it was too dark to see but the movements of the lion kept me apprised of its position whenever i heard it on one side of the tree i speedily changed to the opposite an exercise which in my weakened state i could only have performed under the impulse of terror i would alternately sweat and thrill with horror at the thought of being torn to pieces and devoured by this formidable monster all my attempts to frighten it seemed unavailing disheartened at its persistency and expecting every moment it would take the deadly leap i tried to collect my thoughts and prepare for the fatal encounter which i knew must result just at this moment it occurred to me that i would try silence clasping the trunk of the tree with both arms i sat perfectly still the lion at this time ranging around occasionally snuffing and pausing and all the while filling the forest with the echo of his howlings suddenly imitated my example this silence was more terrible if possible than the clatter and crash of his movements through the brushwood for now i did not know from what direction to expect his attack moments passed with me like hours 
after a lapse of time which i cannot estimate the beast gave a spring into the thicket and ran screaming into the forest my deliverance was effected had strength permitted i should have retained my perch till daylight but with the consciousness of escape from the jaws of the ferocious brute came a sense of overpowering weakness which almost palsied me and made my descent from the tree both difficult and dangerous incredible as it may seem i lay down in my old bed and was soon lost in a slumber so profound that i did not awake until after daylight the experience of the night seemed like a terrible dream but the broken limbs which in the agony of consternation i had thrown from the tree and the rifts made in fallen foliage by my visitant in his circumambulations were too convincing evidences of its reality i could not dwell upon my exposure and escape without shuddering and reflecting that probably like perils would often occur under less fortunate circumstances and with a more fatal issue i wondered what fate was in reserve for me whether i should ultimately sink from exhaustion and perish of starvation or become the prey of some of the ferocious animals that roamed these vast fastnesses my thoughts then turned to the loved ones at home they could never know my fate and would indulge a thousand conjectures concerning it not the least distressing of which would be that i had been captured by a band of hostile sioux and tortured to death at the stake i was roused from this train of reflections by a marked change in the atmosphere one of those dreary storms of mingled snow and rain common to these high altitudes set in my clothing which had been much torn exposed my person to its pitiless peltings an easterly wind rising to a gale admonished me that it would be furious and of long duration none of the discouragements i had met with dissipated the hope of rejoining my friends but foreseeing the delay now unavoidable i knew that my escape from the wilderness must be accomplished if at all by my own unaided exertions this thought was terribly afflicting and brought before me in vivid array all the dreadful realities of my condition i could see no ray of hope in this condition of mind i could find no better shelter than the spreading branches of a spruce tree under which covered with earth and boughs i lay during the two succeeding days the storm meanwhile raging with unabated violence while thus exposed and suffering from cold and hunger a little benumbed bird not larger than a snowbird hopped within my reach i instantly seized and killed it and plucking its feathers ate it raw it was a delicious meal for a half-starved man taking advantage of a lull in the elements on the morning of the third day i rose early and started in the direction of a large group of hot springs which were steaming under the shadow of mount everts the distance i travelled could not have been less than ten miles long before i reached the wonderful cluster of natural cauldrons the storm had recommenced chilled through with my clothing thoroughly saturated i lay down under a tree upon the heated incrustation until completely warmed my heels and the sides of my feet were frozen as soon as warmth had permeated my system and i had quieted my appetite with a few thistle roots i took a survey of my surroundings and selected a spot between two springs sufficiently asunder to afford heat at my head and feet on this spot i built a bower of pine branches spread its encrusted surface with fallen foliage and small boughs and stowed myself away to await the close of the storm thistles were abundant and i had fed upon them long enough to realize that they would for a while at least sustain life in convenient proximity to my abode was a small round boiling spring which i called my dinner pot in which from time to time i cooked my roots this establishment the best i could improvise with the means at hand i occupied seven days the first three of which were darkened by one of the most furious storms i ever saw the vapour which supplied me with warmth saturated my clothing with its condensations i was enveloped in a perpetual steam bath at first this was barely preferable to the storm but i soon became accustomed to it 
and before i left though thoroughly parboiled actually enjoyed it i had little else to do during my imprisonment but cook think and sleep of the variety and strangeness of my reflections it is impossible to give the faintest conception much of my time was given to devising means for escape i recollected to have read at the time of their publication the narratives of lieutenant strain and dr kane and derived courage and hope from the reflection that they struggled with and survived perils not unlike those which environed me the chilling thought would then occur that they were not alone they had companions in suffering and sympathy each could bear his share of the burden of misery which it fell to my lot to bear alone and make it lighter from the encouragement of mutual counsel and aid in a cause of common suffering selfish as the thought may seem there was nothing i so much desired as a companion in misfortune how greatly it would alleviate my distress what a relief it would be to compare my wretchedness with that of a brother sufferer and with him devise expedients for every exigency as it occurred i confess to the weakness if it be one of having squandered much pity upon myself during the time i had little else to do nothing gave me more concern than the want of fire i recalled everything i had ever read or heard of the means by which fire could be produced but none of them were within my reach an escape without it was simply impossible it was indispensable as a protection against night attacks from wild beasts exposure to another storm like the one just over would destroy my life as this one would have done but for the warmth derived from the springs as i lay in my bower anxiously awaiting the disappearance of the snow which had fallen to the depth of a foot or more and impressed with the belief that for want of fire i should be obliged to remain among the springs it occurred to me that i would erect some sort of monument which might at some future day inform a casual visitor of the circumstances under which i had perished a gleam of sunshine lit up the bosom of the lake and with it the thought flashed upon my mind that i could with a lens from my opera glasses get fire from heaven oh happy life-renewing thought instantly subjecting it to the test of experiment when i saw the smoke curl from the bit of dry wood in my fingers i felt if the whole world were offered me for it i would cast it all aside before parting with that little spark i was now the happy possessor of food and fire these would carry me through all thoughts of failure were instantly abandoned though the food was barely adequate to my necessities a fact too painfully attested by my attenuated body i had forgotten the cravings of hunger and had the means of producing fire i said to myself i will not despair my stay at the springs was prolonged several days by an accident that befell me on the third night after my arrival there an unlucky movement while asleep broke the crust on which i reposed and the hot steam pouring upon my hip scalded it severely before i could escape this new affliction added to my frost-bitten feet already festering was the cause of frequent delays and unceasing pain through all my wanderings after obtaining fire i set to work making preparations for as early departure as my condition would permit i had lost both knives since parting from the company but i now made a convenient substitute by sharpening the tongue of a buckle which i cut from my vest with this i cut the legs and counters from my boots making of them a passable pair of slippers which i fastened to my feet as firmly as i could with strips of bark with the ravelings of a linen handkerchief aided by the magic buckle tongue i mended my clothing of the same material i made a fish line which on finding a piece of red tape in one of my pockets better suited to the purpose i abandoned as a bad job i made of a pin that i found in my coat a fish hook and by sewing up the bottoms of my boot legs constructed a good pair of pouches to carry my food in fastening them to my belt by the straps thus accoutred on the morning of the eighth day after my arrival at the springs i bade them a final farewell and started on my course 
directly across that portion of the neck of the peninsula between me and the southeast arm of yellowstone lake it was a beautiful morning the sun shone bright and warm and there was a freshness in the atmosphere truly exhilarating as i wandered musingly along the consciousness of being alone and of having surrendered all hope of finding my friends returned upon me with crushing power i felt too that those friends by the necessities of their conditions had been compelled to abandon all efforts for my recovery the thought was full of bitterness and sorrow i tried to realize what their conjectures were concerning my disappearance but could derive no consolation from the long and dismal train of circumstances they suggested weakened by a long fast and the unsatisfying nature of the only food i could procure i know that from this time onward to the day of my rescue my mind though unimpaired in those perceptions needful to self-preservation was in a condition to receive impressions akin to insanity i was constantly travelling in dreamland and indulging in strange reveries such as i had never before known i seemed to possess a sort of duality of being which while constantly reminding me of the necessities of my condition fed my imagination with vagaries of the most extravagant character nevertheless i was perfectly conscious of the tendency of these morbid influences and often tried to shake them off but they would ever return with increased force and i finally reasoned myself into the belief that their indulgence as it afforded me pleasure could work no harm while it did not interfere with my plans for deliverance thus i lived in a world of ideal happiness and in a world of positive suffering at the same time a change in the wind and an overcast sky accompanied by cold brought with them a need of warmth i drew out my lens and touchwood but alas there was no sun i sat down on a log to await his friendly appearance hours passed he did not come night cold freezing night set in and found me exposed to all its terrors a bleak hillside sparsely covered with pines afforded poor accommodation for a half-clad famished man i could only keep from freezing by the most active exertion in walking rubbing and striking my benumbed feet and hands against the logs it seemed the longest most terrible night of my life and glad was i when the approaching dawn enabled me to commence retracing my steps to bessie lake i arrived there at noon built my first fire on the beach and remained by it recuperating for the succeeding two days the faint hope that my friends might be delayed by their search for me until i could rejoin them now forsook me altogether i made my arrangements independent of it either of three directions i might take would effect my escape if life and strength held out i drew upon the sand of the beach a map of these several courses with reference to my starting point from the lake and considered well the difficulties each would present all were sufficiently defined to avoid mistake one was to follow snake river a distance of one hundred miles or more to eagle rock bridge another to cross the country between the southern shore of yellowstone lake and the madison mountains by scaling which i could easily reach the settlements in the madison valley and the other to retrace my journey over the long and discouraging route by which i had entered the country of these routes the last mention seemed the least inviting probably because i had so recently traversed it and was familiar with its difficulties i had heard and read so much concerning the desolation and elemental upheavals and violent waters of the upper valley of the snake that i dared not attempt to return in that direction the route by the madison range encumbered by the single obstruction of the mountain barrier was much the shortest and so most unwisely as will hereafter appear i adopted it filling my pouches with thistle roots i took a parting survey of the little solitude that had afforded me food and fire the preceding ten days and with something of that melancholy feeling experienced by one who leaves his home to grapple with untried adventures started for the nearest point on yellowstone lake 
all that day i travelled over timber heaps amid tree tops and through thickets at noon i took the precaution to obtain fire with a brand which i kept alive by frequent blowing and constant waving to and fro at a late hour in the afternoon faint and exhausted i kindled a fire for the night on the only vacant spot i could find amid a dense wilderness of pines the deep gloom of the forest in the spectral light which revealed on all sides of me a compact and unending growth of trunks and an impervious canopy of sombre foliage the shrieking of night birds the supernaturally human scream of the mountain lion the prolonged howl of the wolf made me insensible to all other forms of suffering the burn on my hip was so inflamed that i could only sleep in a sitting posture seated with my back against a tree the smoke from the fire almost enveloping me in its suffocating folds i vainly tried amid the din and uproar of this horrible serenade to woo the drowsy god my imagination was instinct with terror at one moment it seemed as if in the density of a thicket i could see the blazing eyes of a formidable forest monster fixed upon me preparatory to a deadly leap at another i fancied that i heard the swift approach of a pack of yelping wolves through the distant brushwood which in a few minutes would tear me limb from limb whenever by fatigue and weakness my terror yielded to drowsiness the least noise roused me to a sense of the hideousness of my condition once in a fitful slumber i fell forward into the fire and inflicted a wretched burn on my hand oh with what agony i longed for day a bright and glorious morning succeeded the dismal night and brought with it the conviction that i had been the victim of uncontrollable nervous excitement i resolved henceforth to banish it altogether and in much better spirits than i anticipated resumed my journey towards the lake another day of unceasing toil among the tree-tops and thickets overtook me near sunset standing upon a lofty headland jutting into the lake and commanding a magnificent prospect of the mountains and valley over an immense area in front of me at a distance of fifty miles away in the clear blue of the horizon rose the arrowy peaks of the three tetons on the right and apparently in close proximity to the eminence i occupied rolled the picturesque range of the madison scarred with clefts ravines gorges and canyons each of which glittered in the sunlight or deepened in shadow as the fitful rays of the descending luminary glanced along their varied rocky irregularities above where i stood were the lofty domes of mounts langford and doan marking the limits of that wonderful barrier which had so long defied human power in its efforts to subdue it rising seemingly from the promontory which favoured my vision was the familiar summit of mount everts at the base of which i had dwelt so long and which still seemed to hold me within its friendly shadow all the vast country within this grand enclosure of mountain and lake scarred and seamed with the grotesque ridges rocky escarpments undulating hillocks and miniature lakes and steaming with hot springs produced by the volcanic forces of a former era lay spread out before me like a vast panorama i doubt if distress and suffering can ever entirely obliterate all sense of natural grandeur and magnificence lost in the wonder and admiration inspired by this vast world of beauties i nearly forgot to improve the few moments of remaining sunshine to obtain fire with a lighted brand in my hand i effected a most difficult and arduous descent of the abrupt and stony headland to the beach of the lake the sand was soft and yielding i kindled a fire and removing the stiffened slippers from my feet attached them to my belt and wandered barefoot along the sandy shore to gather wood for the night the dry warm sand was most grateful to my lacerated and festering feet and for a long time after my woodpile was supplied i sat with them uncovered at length conscious of the need of every possible protection from the freezing night atmosphere i sought my belt for the slippers and one was missing in gathering the wood it had become detached and was lost 
darkness was closing over the landscape when sorely disheartened with the thought of passing the night with one foot exposed to freezing temperature i commenced a search for the missing slipper i knew i could not travel a day without it fearful that it had dropped into the lake and been carried by some recurrent wave beyond recovery my search for an hour among fallen trees and bushes up the hillside and along the beach in darkness and with flaming brands at one moment crawling on hands and feet into a brush heap another peering among logs and bushes and stones was filled with anxiety and dismay success at length rewarded my perseverance and no language can describe the joy with which i drew the cause of so much distress from beneath the limb that as i passed had torn it from my belt with a feeling of great relief i now sat down in the sand my back to a log and listened to the dash and roar of the waves it was a wild lullaby but had no terrors for a worn-out man i never passed a night of more refreshing sleep when i awoke my fire was extinguished save a few embers which i soon fanned into a cheerful flame i ate breakfast with some relish and started along the beach in pursuit of a camp believing that if successful i should find directions what to do and food to sustain me the search which i was making lay in the direction of my prearranged route to the madison mountains which i intended to approach at their lowest point of altitude End of part eight. Part nine of Yellowstone National Park Six Early Pieces by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part nine Thirty Seven Days of Peril. Part two buoyed by the hope of finding food and counsel and another night of undisturbed repose in the sand i resumed my journey along the shore and at noon found the camp last occupied by my friends on the lake a thorough search for food in the ground and trees revealed nothing and no notice to apprise me of their movements could be seen a dinner fork which afterwards proved to be of infinite service in digging roots and a yeast powdered can which would hold half a pint and which i converted into a drinking cup and dinner pot were the only evidences that the spot had ever been visited by civilized man oh thought i why did they forget to leave me food it never occurring to me that they might have cached it as i have since learned they did in several spots nearer the place of my separation from them i left the camp in deep dejection with the purpose of following the trail of the party to the madison carefully inspecting the faint traces left of their course of travel i became satisfied that from some cause they had made a retrograde movement from this camp and departed from the lake at a point further downstream taking this as an indication that there were obstructions above i commenced retracing my steps along the beach an hour of sunshine in the afternoon enabled me to procure fire which in the usual manner i carried to my camping-place there i built a fire and to protect myself from the wind which was blowing violently lashing the lake into foam i made a bower of pine boughs crept under it and very soon fell asleep how long i slept i know not but i was aroused by the snapping and crackling of the burning foliage to find my shelter and the adjacent forest in a broad sheet of flame my left hand was badly burned and my hair singed closer than a barber would have trimmed it while making my escape from the semicircle of burning trees among the disasters of this fire there was none i felt more seriously than the loss of my buckle-tongue knife my pen fish-hook and tape fish-line the grandeur of the burning forest surpasses description an immense sheet of flame following to their tops the lofty trees of an almost impenetrable pine forest leaping madly from top to top and sending thousands of forked tongues a hundred feet or more athwart the midnight darkness lighting up with lurid gloom and glare the surrounding scenery of lake and mountains fills the beholder with mingled feelings of awe and astonishment i never before saw anything so terribly beautiful 
it was marvellous to witness the flash-like rapidity with which the flames would mount the loftiest trees the roaring cracking crashing and snapping of falling limbs and burning foliage was deafening on and on on travelled the destructive element until it seemed as if the whole forest was enveloped in flame afar up on the wood-crowned hill the overtopping trees shot forth pinnacles and walls and streamers of arrowy fire the entire hillside was an ocean of glowing and surging fiery billows favoured by the gale the conflagration spread with lightning swiftness over an illimitable extent of country filling the atmosphere with driving clouds of suffocating fume and leaving a broad and blackened trail of spectral trunks shorn of limbs and foliage smoking and burning to mark the immense sweep of its devastation resolved to search for a trail no longer when daylight came i selected for a landmark the lowest notch in the madison range carefully surveying the jagged and broken surface over which i must travel to reach it i left the lake and pushed into the midst of its intricacies all the day until nearly sunset i struggled over rugged hills through windfalls thickets and matted forests with the rock-ribbed beacon constantly in view as i advanced it receded as if in mockery of my toil night overtook me with my journey half accomplished the precaution of obtaining fire gave me warmth and sleep and long before daylight i was on my way the hope of finding an easy pass into the valley of the madison inspired me with fresh courage and determination but long before i arrived at the base of the range i scanned hopelessly its insurmountable difficulties it presented to my eager vision an endless succession of inaccessible peaks and precipices rising thousands of feet sheer and bare above the plain no friendly gorge or gully or canyon invited such an effort as i could make to scale this rocky barrier oh for the faith that could remove mountains how soon should this colossal fabric open at my approach what a feeling of helpless despair came over me with the conviction that the journey of the last two days had been in vain i seated myself on a rock upon the summit of a commanding hill and cast my eyes along the only route which now seemed tenable down the yellowstone how many dreary miles of forest and mountain filled the terrible panorama i thought that before accepting this discouraging alternative i would spend a day in search for a pass twenty miles at most would take me into the madison valley and thirty more restore me to friends who had abundance supposing that i should find plenty of thistles i had left the lake with a small supply and that was entirely spent i looked in vain for them where i then was while i was thus considering whether to remain and search for a passage or return to the yellowstone i experienced one of those strange hallucinations which many of my friends have misnamed insanity but which to me was providence an old clerical friend for whose character and counsel i had always cherished peculiar regard in some unaccountable manner seemed to be standing before me charged with advice which would relieve my perplexity i seemed to hear him say as if in a voice and with the manner of authority go back immediately as rapidly as your strength will permit there is no food here and the idea of scaling these rocks is madness doctor i rejoined the distance is too great i cannot live to travel it say not so your life depends upon the effort return at once start now lest your resolution falter travel as fast and as far as possible it is your only chance doctor i am rejoiced to meet you in this hour of distress but doubt the wisdom of your counsel i am within seventy miles of virginia just over these rocks a few miles away i shall find friends my shoes are nearly worn out my clothes are in tatters and my strength is almost overcome as a last trial it seems to me i can but attempt to scale this mountain or perish in the effort if god so wills don't think of it your power of endurance will carry you through i will accompany you put your trust in heaven help yourself and god will help you 
overcome by these and other persuasions and delighted with the idea of having a travelling companion i plotted my way over the route i had come intending at a certain point to change it so as to strike the river at the foot of the lake stopping after a few miles of travel i had no difficulty in procuring fire and passed a comfortable night when i resumed my journey the next day the sun was just rising whenever i was disposed as was often the case to question the wisdom of the change of routes my old friend appeared to be near with words of encouragement but his reticence on other subjects both surprised and annoyed me i was impressed at times during the entire journey with the belief that my return was a fatal error and if my deliverance had failed should have perished with that conviction early this day i deflected from my old route and took my course for the foot of the lake with the hope by constant travel to reach it the next day the distance was greater than i anticipated nothing is more deceptive than distance in these high latitudes at the close of each of the two succeeding days my point of destination was seemingly as far from me as at the moment i took leave of the madison range and when cold and hungry on the afternoon of the fourth day i gathered the first food i had eaten in nearly five days and lay down by my fire near the debouchure of the river i had nearly abandoned all hope of escape at daybreak i was on the trail down the river the thought i had adopted from the first i will not perish in this wilderness often revived my sinking spirits when from faintness and exhaustion i felt but little desire for life once while struggling through a field of tangled trunks which seemed interminable at one of the pauses i found myself seriously considering whether it was not preferable to die there than renew the effort to proceed i felt that all attempt to escape was but a bitter prolongation of the agony of dissolution a seeming whisper in the air while there is life there is hope take courage broke the delusion and i clambered on i did not forget to improve the midday sun to procure fire sparks from the lighted brands had burned my hands and crisped the nails of my fingers and the smoke from them had tanned my face to the complexion of an indian while passing through an opening in the forest i found the tip of a gull's wing it was fresh i made a fire upon the spot mashed the bones with a stone and consigning them to my camp kettle the yeast powder box made half a pint of delicious broth the remainder of that day and the night ensuing were given to sleep i lost all sense of time days and nights came and went and were numbered only by the growing consciousness that i was gradually starving i felt no hunger did not eat to appease appetite but to renew strength i experienced but little pain the gaping sores on my feet the severe burn on my hip the festering crevices at the joints of my fingers all terrible in appearance had ceased to give me the least concern the roots which supplied my food had suspended the digestive power of the stomach and their fibres were packed in it a matted compact mass not so with my hours of slumber they were visited by the most luxurious dreams i would apparently visit the most gorgeously decorated restaurants of new york and washington sit down to immense tables spread with the most appetizing viands partake of the richest oyster stews and plumpest pies engage myself in the labour and preparation of curious dishes and with them fill range upon range of elegantly furnished tables until they fairly groaned beneath the accumulated dainties prepared by my own hands frequently the entire night would seem to have been spent in getting up a sumptuous dinner i would realize the fatigue of roasting boiling baking and fabricating the choicest dishes known to the modern cuisine and in my disturbed slumbers would enjoy with epicurean relish the food thus furnished even to repletion alas there was more luxury than life in these somnolent vagaries it was a cold gloomy day when i arrived in the vicinity of the falls 
the sky was overcast and the snow-capped peaks rose chilly and bleak through the biting atmosphere the moaning of the wind through the pines mingling with the sullen roar of the falls was strangely in unison with my own saddened feelings i had no heart to gaze upon a scene which a few weeks before had inspired me with rapture and awe one moment of sunshine was of more value to me than all the marvels amid which i was famishing but the sun had hid his face and denied me all hope of obtaining fire the only alternative was to seek shelter in a thicket i penetrated the forest a long distance before finding one that suited me breaking and crowding my way into its very midst i cleared a spot large enough to recline upon interlaced the surrounding brushwood gathered the fallen foliage into a bed and lay down with a prayer for sleep and forgetfulness alas neither came the coldness increased through the night constant friction with my hands and unceasing beating with my legs and feet saved me from freezing it was the most terrible night of my journey and when with the early dawn i pulled myself into a standing posture it was to realize that my right arm was partially paralyzed and my limbs so stiffened with cold as to be almost immovable fearing lest paralysis should suddenly seize the entire system i literally dragged myself through the forest to the river seated near the verge of the great canyon below the falls i anxiously awaited the appearance of the sun that great luminary never looked so beautiful as when a few moments afterwards he emerged from the clouds and exposed his glowing beams to the concentrated powers of my lens i kindled a mighty flame and fed it with every dry stick and broken tree-top i could find and without motion and almost without sense remained beside it several hours the great falls of the yellowstone were roaring within three hundred yards and the awful canyon yawned almost at my feet but they had lost all charm for me in fact i regarded them as enemies which had lured me to destruction and felt a sullen satisfaction in morbid indifference my old friend and adviser whose presence i had felt more than seen the last few days now forsook me altogether but i was not alone by some process which i was too weak to solve my arms legs and stomach were transformed into so many travelling companions often for hours i would plod along conversing with these imaginary friends each had his peculiar wants which he expected me to supply the stomach was importunate in his demand for a change of diet complained incessantly of the roots i fed him their present effect and more remote consequences i could try to silence him with promises beg of him to wait a few days and when this failed of the quiet i desired i would seek to intimidate him by declaring as a sure result of negligence our inability to reach home alive all to no purpose he tormented me with his fretful humours through the entire journey the others would generally concur with him in these fancied altercations the legs implored me for rest and the arms complained that i gave them too much to do troublesome as they were it was a pleasure to realize their presence i worked for them too with right good will doing many things for their comfort which had i felt alone would have remained undone they appeared to be perfectly helpless of themselves would do nothing for me or for each other i often wondered while they ate and slept so much that they did not aid in gathering wood and kindling fires as a counterpoise to their own inertia whenever they discovered languor in me on necessary occasions they were not wanting in words of encouragement and cheer i recall as i write an instance where by prompt and timely interposition the representative of the stomach saved me from a death of dreadful agony one day i came to a small stream issuing from a spring of mild temperature on the hillside swarming with minnows i caught some with my hands and ate them raw to my taste they were delicious but the stomach refused them accused me of attempting to poison him 
and would not be reconciled until i had emptied my pouch of the few fish i had put there for future use those that i ate made me very sick poisoned by the mineral in the water had i glutted my appetite with them as i intended i should doubtless have died in the wilderness in excruciating torment a gradual mental introversion grew upon me as physical weakness increased the grand and massive scenery which on the upward journey had aroused every enthusiastic impulse of my nature was now tame and spiritless my thoughts were turned in upon myself upon the dreadful fate which apparently lay just before me and the possible happiness of the existence beyond all doubt of immortality fled in the light of present realities so vivid were my conceptions of the future that at times i longed for death not less as the beginning of happiness than as a release from misery led on by these reflections i would recall the varied incidents of my journey my escape from the lion from fire my return from madison range and in all of them i saw how much i had been indebted to that mysterious protection which comes only from the throne of the eternal and yet starving footsore half-blind worn to a skeleton was it surprising that i lacked the faith needful to buoy me above the dark waters of despair which i now felt were closing around me in less serious moods as i struggled along my thoughts would revert to the single being on whom my holiest affection centred my daughter what a tie was that to bind me to life oh could i be restored to her for a single hour long enough for parting counsel and blessing it would be joy unspeakable long hours of painful travel were relieved of physical suffering by this absorbing agony of mind which when from my present standpoint i contrast it with the personal calamities of my exile swells into mountains to return from this digression at many of the streams on my route i spent hours in endeavouring to catch trout with a hook fashioned from the rim of my broken spectacles but in no instance with success the tackle was defective the country was full of game in great variety i saw large herds of deer elk antelope occasionally a bear and many smaller animals numerous flocks of ducks geese swans and pelicans inhabited the lakes and rivers but with no means of killing them their presence was a perpetual aggravation at all the camps of our company i stopped and recalled many pleasant incidents associated with them one afternoon when approaching tower falls i came upon a large hollow tree which from the numerous tracks surrounding it and the matted foliage in the cavity i recognized as the den of a bear it was a most inviting couch gathering a needful supply of wood and brush i lighted a circle of piles around the tree crawled into the nest and passed a night of unbroken slumber i rose the next morning to find that during the night the fires had communicated with the adjacent forest and burned a large space in all directions doubtless intimidating the rightful proprietor of the nest and saving me from another midnight adventure at tower falls i spent the first half of a day in capturing a grasshopper and the remainder in a fruitless effort to catch a mess of trout in the agony of disappointment i resolved to fish no more a spirit of rebellion seized me i determined that thistles should thenceforth be my only sustenance why is it i asked myself that in the midst of abundance every hour meeting with objects which would restore strength and vigour and energy every moment contriving some device to procure the nourishment my wasting frame requires i should meet with these repeated and discouraging failures thoughts of the early teaching of a pious mother suppressed these feelings oh how often have the recollections of a loved new england home and the memories of a happy childhood cheered my sinking spirits and dissipated the gathering gloom of despair there were thoughts and feelings and mental anguishes without number that visited me during my period of trial that never can be known to any but my god and myself bitter as was my experience it was not unrelieved by some of the most precious moments i have ever known 
soon after leaving tower falls i entered the open country pine forests and windfalls were changed for sagebrush and desolation with occasional tracts of stinted verdure barren hillsides exhibiting here and there an isolated clump of dwarf trees and ravines filled with the rocky debris of adjacent mountains my first camp on this part of the route for the convenience of getting wood was made near the summit of a range of towering foothills towards morning a storm of wind and snow nearly extinguished my fire i became very cold the storm was still raging when i arose and the ground white with snow i was perfectly bewildered and had lost my course of travel no visible object seen through the almost blinding storm reassured me and there was no alternative but to find the river and take my direction from its current fortunately after a few hours of stumbling and scrambling among rocks and over crests i came to the precipitous side of the canyon through which it ran and with much labour both of hands and feet descended it to the margin i drank copiously of its pure waters and sat beside it for a long time waiting for the storm to abate so that i could procure fire the day wore on without any prospect of a termination of the storm chilled through my tattered clothing saturated i saw before me a night of horrors unless i returned to my fire the scramble up the side of the rocky canyon in many places nearly perpendicular was the hardest work of my journey often while clinging to the jutting rocks with hands and feet to reach a shelving projection my grasp would unclose and i would slide many feet down the sharp declivity it was night when sore from the bruises i had received i reached my fire the storm still raging had nearly extinguished it i found a few embers in the ashes and with much difficulty kindled a flame here on this bleak mountain side as well as i now remember i must have passed two nights beside the fire in the storm many times during each night i crawled to a little clump of trees to gather wood and brush and the broken limbs of fallen tree-tops all the sleep i obtained was snatched from the intervals which divided these labours it was so harassed with frightful dreams as to afford little rest i remember before i left this camp stripping up my sleeves to look at my shrunken arms flesh and blood had apparently left them the skin clung to the bones like wet parchment a child's hands could have clasped them from wrist to shoulder yet thought i it is death to remain i cannot perish in this wilderness taking counsel of this early formed resolution i hobbled on my course through the snow which was rapidly disappearing before the rays of the warm sun well knowing that i should find no thistles in the open country i had filled my pouches with them before leaving the forest my supply was running low and there were several days of heavy mountain travel between me and burtler's ranch with the most careful economy it could last but two or three days longer i saw the necessity of placing myself and imaginary companions upon allowance the conflict which ensued with the stomach when i announced this resolution required great firmness to carry through i tried wheedling and coaxing and promising failing in these i threatened to part company with a comrade so unreasonable and he made no further complaint two or three days before i was found while ascending a steep hill i fell from exhaustion into a sagebrush without the power to rise unbuckling my belt as was my custom i soon fell asleep i have no idea of the time i slept but upon awakening i fastened my belt scrambled to my feet and pursued my journey as night drew on i selected a camping place gathered wood into a heap and felt for my lens to procure fire it was gone if the earth had yawned to swallow me i would not have been more terrified the only chance for life was lost the last hope had fled 
i seemed to feel the grim messenger who had been long pursuing me knocking at the portals of my heart as i lay down by the side of the woodpile and covered myself with limbs and sagebrush with the dreadful conviction that my struggle of life was over and i should rise no more the floodgates of misery seemed now to be opened and it rushed in living tide upon my soul with the rapidity of lightning i ran over every event of my life thoughts doubled and trebled upon me until i saw as if in vision the entire past of my existence it was all before me as if painted with a sunbeam and all seemingly faded like the phantoms of a vivid dream as calmness returned reason resumed her empire fortunately the weather was comfortable i summoned all the powers of my memory thought over every foot of the day's travel and concluded that the glass must have become detached from my belt while sleeping five long miles over the hills must be retraced to regain it there was no alternative and before daylight i had staggered over half the distance i found the lens on the spot where i had slept no incident of my journey brought with it more of joy and relief returning to the camp of the previous night i lighted the pile i had prepared and lay down for a night of rest it was very cold and towards morning commenced snowing with difficulty i kept the fire alive sleep was impossible when daylight came i was impressed with the idea that i must go on despite the storm a flash momentary but vivid came over me that i should be saved snatching a lighted brand i started through the storm in the afternoon the storm abated and the sun shone at intervals coming to a small clump of trees i set to work to prepare a camp i laid the brand down which i had preserved with so much care to pick up a few dry sticks with which to feed it until i could collect wood for a campfire and in a few minutes thus employed it expired i sought to revive it but every spark was gone clouds obscured the sun now near the horizon and the prospect of another night of exposure without fire became fearfully imminent i sat down with my lens and the last remaining piece of touchwood i possessed to catch a gleam of sunshine feeling that my life depended upon it in a few minutes the cloud passed and with trembling hands i presented the little disc to the face of the glowing luminary quivering with excitement lest a sudden cloud should interpose a moment passed before i could hold the lens steadily enough to concentrate a burning focus at length it came the little thread of smoke curled gracefully upwards from the heaven-lighted spark which a few moments afterwards diffused with warmth and comfort my desolate lodgings i resumed my journey the next morning with the belief that i should make no more fires with my lens i must save a brand or perish the day was raw and gusty an east wind charged with storm penetrated my nerves with irritating keenness after walking a few miles the storm came on and a coldness unlike any other i had ever felt seized me it entered all my bones i attempted to build a fire but could not make it burn seizing a brand i stumbled blindly on stopping within the shadow of every rock and clump to renew energy for a final conflict for life a solemn conviction that death was near that at each pause i made my limbs would refuse further service and that i should sink helpless and dying in my path overwhelmed me with terror amid all this tumult of the mind i felt that i had done all that man could do i knew that in two or three days more i could effect my deliverance and i derived no little satisfaction from the thought that as i now was in the broad trail my remains would be found and my friends relieved of doubt as to my fate once only the thought flashed across my mind that i should be saved and i seemed to hear a whispered command to struggle on groping along the side of a hill i became suddenly sensible of a sharp reflection as of burnished steel looking up through half-closed eyes two rough but kindly faces met my gaze are you mr everts 
yes all that is left of him we have come for you who sent you judge lawrence and other friends god bless him and them and you i am saved and with these words powerless of further effort i fell forward into the arms of my preservers in a state of unconsciousness i was saved on the very brink of the river which divided the known from the unknown strong arms snatched me from the final plunge and kind ministrations wooed me back to life baronet and pritchett my two preservers by the usual appliances soon restored me to consciousness made a camp upon the spot and while one went to fort ellis a distance of seventy miles to return with remedies to restore digestion and an ambulance to convey me to that post the other sat by my side and with all the care sympathy and solicitude of a brother ministered to my frequent necessities in two days i was sufficiently recovered in strength to be moved twenty miles down the trail to the cabin of some miners who were prospecting in that vicinity from these men i received every possible attention which their humane and generous natures could devise a good bed was provided game was killed to make broth and the best stores of their larder placed at my command for four days at a time when every day's labor was invaluable in their pursuit they abandoned their work to aid in my restoration owing to the protracted inaction of the system and the long period which must transpire before pritchett's return with remedies my friends had serious doubts of my recovery the night after my arrival at the cabin while suffering the most excruciating agony and thinking that i had only been saved to die among friends a loud knock was heard at the cabin door an old man in mountain costume entered a hunter whose life was spent among the mountains he was on his way to find a brother he listened to the story of my sufferings and tears rapidly coursed each other down his rough weather-beaten face but when he was told of my present necessity brightening in a moment he exclaimed why lord bless you if that is all i have the very remedy you need in two hours time all shall be well with you he left the cabin returning in a moment with a sack filled with the fat of a bear which he had killed a few hours before from this he rendered out a pint measure of oil i drank the whole of it it proved to be the needed remedy and the next day freed from pain with appetite and digestion re-established i felt that good food and plenty of it were only necessary for an early recovery in a day or two i took leave of my kind friends with a feeling of regret at parting and gratitude for their kindness as enduring as life meeting the carriage on my way i proceeded to bozeman where i remained among old friends who gave me every attention until my health was sufficiently restored to allow me to return to my home in helena my heartfelt thanks are due to the members of the expedition all of whom devoted seven and some of them twelve days to the search for me before they left yellowstone lake and to judge lawrence of helena and the friends who cooperated with him in the offer of reward which sent baronet and pritchett to my rescue my narrative is finished in the course of events the time is not far distant when the wonders of the yellowstone will be made accessible to all lovers of sublimity grandeur and novelty in natural scenery and its majestic waters become the abode of civilization and refinement and when that arrives i hope in happier mood and under more auspicious circumstances to revisit scenes fraught for me with such thrilling interest to ramble along the glowing beach of bessie lake to sit down amid the hot springs under the shade of mount everts to thread unscarred the mazy forests retrace the dreary journey to the madison range and with enraptured fancy gaze upon the mingled glories and terrors of the great falls and marvellous canyon and to enjoy in happy contrast with the trials they recall their power to delight elevate and overwhelm the mind with wondrous and majestic beauty end of part nine 
End of Yellowstone National Park Six Early Pieces by Various